TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. It's your friendly neighborhood philosopher here, D. Wood. And with me now is your not-so-friendly neighborhood, sons of anarchy, reject, uh, theologian, Anthony Rogers. How you doing, Anthony? I'm doing good. Where'd you get the, Where'd you get your, your awesome name, sons of anarchy, reject? From the Hebrew Israelites. It's probably, wasn't it Sakari? I think uh, it was Sakari. I don't remember what those dudes say, but yeah, yeah that yeah. sounds like them. Well, that sounds like them. I, I'm pretty sure it's them. I give them props. Most they are. They're the best at names. Insult, yeah, aren't good, but that was good. So <laughs> it, was, it just reminded me of the old days. So <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, so anyway, at least we know they watch Sons of Anarchy. So that's interesting to know. <laughs> hey, we got uh, Daniel Brown here saying, I quit smoking oh, this week, y'all. That's good. Sons of Esau. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. San, Sons of <laughs> Anarchy Sal, uh, something like that. Uh, but hey, Daniel Brown, quit smoking. That's good. Good, good power move there. Good power move. Um, all right. So, Anthony, let me just break down how this topic came up and why, because uh, you've discussed this before in a variety of contexts, and, uh, and, and this has come up in debates and so on. But um, I was recently having a. Two on no, we had two two on two debates. Me and God Logic versus two Quran only Muslims, and the two topics the two topics were was Muhammad a true prophet and was Jesus a Muslim, and so those were the topics. And for both of the debates, the Muslims went right to the Bible to prove their point. So they tried to prove that Muhammad is a prophet from the Bible. And they tried to prove that Jesus is a Muslim from the Bible. And over and over again, whatever the topic was, they would quote a passage and we would just say, uh, hey, read, the, keep reading, keep reading, read a few more verses and see what happens. Or we'd say, uh, hey, back up a little bit, back up in the same passage, see what Jesus is actually talking about there and tell us that, tell us this, this supports Muhammad or tell us that this uh, shows that Jesus is a Muslim. And they had to just keep saying, hey, if we quote one little verse, if we quote one little part of a verse, and that doesn't mean we believe anything else in the passage. So they kept doing that. But they also kept trying to change the subject. So they would quote John 5, and we would say, hey, let's back up a little bit, and you tell, if it's, tell us if this sounds like a Muslim. And uh, yeah, so then they would kept trying to divert to other topics. One of the things they tried to divert to was uh, well, why isn't God a trinity in the Old Testament? I said, we'd be happy to have that debate if you want, but that's not the topic right now, so we can't uh, we can't go down that rabbit trail. But if you want to debate the topic, happy to do it, but let's stick to the actual topic that we're here to debate instead of changing the subject. But uh, it would be good if they did want to debate that to have some sort of idea of what to expect because they very frequently seem to have no clue. They just absorbed the idea that the Old Testament supports Tawheed, and then, you know, you get to Paul and Paul somehow uh, changes things. And uh, then you get somehow the doctrine of the Trinity. But if you just go back, if you just go back, you'd find that uh, that God is uh, what Muslims believe in the Old Testament. And you, you've you broken down why you don't think that's the case. So I thought it'd be a good time here for our Muslim friends to get a little education and see whether their view of the God of the Old Testament is correct. So uh, any introductory thoughts on this, Anthony? Yeah, well, first thing that comes to mind, they do the same thing with respect to the Old Testament's testimony to the doctrine of the Trinity that they tried to do when arguing for Muhammad's prophethood. Cherry picking, right? So if you go to the Old Testament and you excise a word or phrase or sentence at best, from its surrounding context, you can make it support anything. You could prove that you're a prophet from the Bible. Uh, I remember, slightly different, but I remember debating Shabir Ali, and he brought up his famous Miracle 19 to prove that the Quran is inspired by Allah, and I used a mathematical mirror uh, miracle to prove that I'm a prophet. So I took uh, various factors, such as the, the date that the debate was taking place on, uh, just a number of factors, and I showed that I could make all sorts of mathematical connections between that and the same sort of thing that Shabir was doing. But but what that involves, and you've you've done this with Shabir, the, uh, the whole mathematical thing is a shell and pea game. You're ignoring what's not helpful to the case, and you're playing up what you think is. 
And that's what people are doing when they go to the Old Testament and cherry pick verses. They're saying, hey, this works for Muhammad as long as we can only look at this word or only at this phrase. And of course, if we ignore, even when we're looking at words, the lexical meanings of those words, we want to import different meanings. So it'd be the same thing. If you go to the Old Testament to show the Trinity, they're going to say that verse is not relevant. That verse was corrupted. That verse was added. But then at the end of the day, where then is their argument? If their argument is the Old Testament supports Tawhid, but only if I can use my scissors and do a copy paste job, then that's not really impressive. And it's really the it's it's the modus operandi of Islam, isn't it? Everything proves Islam as long as only what we say counts. Uh, so, but before getting into some of the the details, here here's another factor that plays into this. A lot of Muslims make the mistake that many other groups make that are anti-trinitarian. They look at their next door neighbor or the Jews down the street at the synagogue, or let's just say a Jewish writer or YouTube guy, take Tovia Singer or Michael Skoback or Rabbi Shmuley, whoever. I, uh, I saw Rabbi Shmuley on the other day. He's a likable guy. But mm -hmm. you know, they assume that these guys are the benchmarks. They assume that whatever these guys believe is necessarily an indication of what ancient Jews believed. And it's just not true. In fact, I could go yeah, one, 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 one second, one second, because uh, there is a super chat that's related to this, which is a, exactly the direction you're going in. So you could gear it towards solitary. Emmy Harris says something I always wonder why Jews who have the Old Testament don't seem to agree with the Trinity. Many Jews have come to Jesus, but I wonder why many haven't, too. So, hey, why why don't why do Jews who have the Old Testament have a problem with the uh, uh, Trinity if it's in there, Anthony? Solitary Emmy, you came to the right place. So first, th here's a book that I recommend every Christian get. It's by Alan Segal. He was a Jewish scholar, not a Christian. He even wrote a book called Paul, the Apostolate and Apostasy of Saul the Pharisee. So he's arguing that Paul, who is an apostle, is an apostate from Judaism. So he was no friend of Paul or of Christianity in general. But he wrote a book that's now justly famous among Christians who are involved in Old Testament studies, Jewish studies, called Two Powers in Heaven, in which he shows that the early Talmudic rabbis, so these are the rabbis after the time of Christ and the apostles, were trying to excise from their midst those Jews and others who believed that there was more than one divine person in the Godhead. And so there's there's copious evidence for this whole issue in the Talmud. And so just as an example, uh, Rabbi Akiva, who's one of the most famed of the ancient rabbis in, in the Talmudic period, he's one of the Tanaim, one of the earliest post-Christian rabbis, even Rabbi Akiva was charged with holding this heresy at one point before he was sufficiently rebuked and made to come back to his senses, as it were. You can't have the most famous rabbi holding on to this view. And so he's he's made uh, an object of reproof. But uh, there, there's just statement after statement in the Talmud talking about this. Now, another Jewish scholar is Daniel Boyarin. He is the uh, Sophia Taubman Professor of Talmudic Culture in the Department of Near Eastern Studies and rhetoric at uh, the University of California, Berkeley. This is his book, Borderlines, The Partition Between Judaism and Christianity. So he's talking about when it is that Judaism and Christianity became distinct religions. Because when you read the book of Acts and you look at the early first century history, these weren't clearly marked off from each other. Christians enjoyed the liberty that, that Jews had in the Roman Empire. They were considered advocates of a legal religion. They had a uh, in other words, the, the, the right to worship according to their conscience when other groups conquered by Rome didn't. But the Jews were too recalcitrant to the Romans, so they had to let them worship God according to their conscience. Well, Boyerin is talking about where is it at, along the way in history that Jews and Christians eventually parted, and he points out that it's something that's developing in the Talmudic period when the Jews are trying to get rid of this idea of two powers or more in heaven, 
because it played into the hands of Christianity. And so much of what you find in intertestamental and Second Temple Jewish literature, so literature from Jews before the coming of Christ and contemporaneous with Christ and the apostles, that kind of literature, you find all sorts of talk about more than one divine person. And the Jews after the coming of Christ began to suppress this as no longer helpful and even problematic because it caters to Christianity. Now, one last point on this is, uh, I, I think in some ways even more interesting, is you can find numerous scholars. So this is Moshe Edel, another Jewish scholar that even won a Jewish book award, as you can see here. It's called Ben, which is the Hebrew word for son, and then it's subtitled Sonship and Jewish Mysticism. He points out that outside of the rabbinic circles, there were Jews who continued to hold on to older traditions that were being suppressed by the Talmudic Jews, the, the standard form of Judaism that we know today. These Jews held on to the earlier traditions and continued to believe in a plurality of divine persons. And so you can find, for example, in Nachmanides, who's another famous medieval rabbi alongside of Nachmanides. Many people have heard of Rambam, Rabbi Moses ben Nachmanides. But over and against him was Nachmanides, and these two had a big dispute over the question of the identity of the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, because ancient Judaism and these Jews, even down to the med medieval period, were still believing in the deity of the angel of the Lord and his inclusion within the Godhead. So that's the that's the brief answer, and th but there's a lot more that goes into that. Check out those books, and you'll and, uh, you'll have more, yeah, more oh, than yeah. enough info. Yeah, I was just going to say, Solitary Amy just uh, posted a follow-up comment saying that she uh, she went ahead and ordered those books that you recommended. So hey, hey. she's going to check those out. Um, one more thing before we, uh, I'm sure this is, uh, I mean, this is relevant to the topic here, but Chloe said, uh, Genesis 18, Abraham fed three angels, not God himself. I'm assuming <laughs> this is. Well, we, we will talk some more about that, but that's just not what the text says. In Genesis 18, 1, it says that Abraham looked up, he's near the oaks of Mamre, and he saw the Lord. The Lord appeared to him. And then when he looks up, he sees three men. First of all, that's what the text says. He sees three men. Then it's the later context that further identifies these three, quote unquote, men that Abraham sees. In one case, it says one of the figures was the Lord. It uses the covenant name of God, Yehovah. And then the other two leave the company of Abraham and the Lord, and they go down into Sodom in Genesis 19. 19 verse 1 says the other two were angels. So if we're actually looking at the text of Genesis 18, and we're not being Muslims and taking out what we don't like, we see that one person is the Lord and the other two are angels. What, what should be problematic here for Muslims is that God is appearing here in the form of a man. What, what I find remarkable about this is I, not being a Muslim, I don't have any problem with God appearing in history, but what I expect is the sort of thing I see in places like Ezekiel 1 or Ezekiel 10, where God appears in awesome glory that's terrifying to the, the people beholding him. So Ezekiel falls down like a dead man, right? And uh, you get the same sort of thing in, in Exodus 3 when Moses encounters God at the burning bush. He turns his face away because he's afraid to look at God. Or the people at Mount Sinai when the mountain, the whole mountain is ablaze and God speaks from the mountain. And they're terrified and say, Moses, you speak to us. We don't want to hear directly from God anymore. That's the sort of thing I expect. What I don't expect is what you see in Genesis 18. Well, now I do as a Christian, obviously, but... When you read it, it's so mundane. God is appearing there like a man. At first, not even Abraham seems to be aware who this visitor is. He rushes to tell Sarah to make food for them. He wants to tend to their needs, clean their feet, and so forth. He doesn't appear to know who his guests are. And that's what's, I think, startling. But to Muslims, it should be downright unnerving. It undermines their entire religion. God appears in time and space, and he appears in the form of a man. It's almost sounding Christian. Yeah. Hmm. And I'm wondering how some of this stuff is going to connect to uh, Jesus' claim in the New Testament that Abraham knew something about him. 
A uh, quick comment here from our good friend Fareed Responds, the guy who watches all our stuff and constantly posts videos about us, but never, ever, ever wants to join us live, no matter how many times we invite him. He says, nice to see David bringing someone that doesn't believe that Jesus is a fraud. So this is interesting. Looks like Fareed is affirming your belief in Jesus, Anthony. Why don't you go ahead and tell him the Jesus that you believe in? I just spoke about him. He was the one that appeared to Abraham. And better than my testimony is the testimony of Jesus. In John 8, and this is what you were alluding to a moment ago, Jesus makes it clear that he knew Abraham and Abraham knew him. They had a face-to-face -face knowledge of each other. What's interesting about John 8, before you ever get to the end, which is what most people look at relevant to this, Earlier in the chapter, the Jews, they're engaged in a protracted debate with Jesus, and they're, they're making these competing claims about paternity. Jesus is talking about who their father is. They're talking about who their father is. He's talking about his father. They're asking about his father. There's all these different levels in the discourse that are going on. The Jews at times don't know who he means by his father, and they don't like what he's saying about their father. And, but, but at one point, so Jesus says, if Abraham were your father, you wouldn't be trying to kill me. Abraham did not do this. Now, the way people normally read that is all too cavalier. They read that as though Jesus is just saying that your character traits, your behavior is not like that of your father. Your father was hospitable, right? He didn't try to kill people. What Jesus is saying is actually more pointed in the Greek text. When Jesus says Abraham did not do this, the, the antecedent of the, of the pronoun there, this, is Abraham did not try to kill me. Uh, or is, it, you know, if Abraham were your father, you would not be trying to kill me. Abraham did not do this. What is this? That is, try to kill me. So Jesus is saying there was an occasion when Abraham had the opportunity to give it a shot, but he didn't try. Abraham didn't do that. And that's why later in the conversation, the Jews finally get the point and they say, wait, you're not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth before Abraham became, I am. So there's Jesus interpretation of the Old Testament. Jesus thinks that the Old Testament testifies to him. And uh, interestingly, that is the view of Jesus that Fareed regards as not a fraud. So Fareed put his stamp of approval on everything that Anthony just said uh, about his view of Jesus. Thank you, Fareed, for the cosign. <laughs> I think you're an apostate now, Fareed, just by saying that. Uh, but but no, Fareed, keep in mind that, you know, even though uh, various people on my live stream may have different views of Jesus, uh, we can all agree that Muhammad is the most obvious false prophet in history. Uh, you agree to you agree to that, Anthony? Oh, of course. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. A couple more Super Chats here, just so we don't get too backed up. We only got a couple, uh, and then we'll jump right into the text. I think we're starting with Genesis 1. That's interesting. If we're talking about Old Testament, we're just going to, like, first chapter type stuff. Hmm. Interesting. Um, let's see. Grays here says, was the second power in heaven allowed to become incarnate in pre-Christian theology? So it's interesting, that's actually part of the sticking point in the New Testament. When you look at the New Testament, the Jews don't have as much of a problem with the idea of a second divine person. There's certain evidence, I'll show you some in a second here, but what they're objecting to is the idea that the man standing before them is claiming to be that second person. And so one classic example would be at Christ's trial, at the trial of Christ, the high priest says, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? And you have to understand here, there's a great article. I'm trying to think of who wrote it. Uh, it's skipping my mind, but uh, it's talking about the nature of appositional constructions in Greek. And what he's pointing out is that there's something called a restrictive apposition and non-restrictive apposition. That's all technical jargon that, that comes to this point. In, in Mark 14, when the high priest says, are you the Christ, the son of the living God, or the son of the blessed one, the question that he's asking is, are you the Christ in this sense? Because there were numerous ideas about the Christ among Jews in the first century. Some would speak merely of him in terms of his sonship to David, so he's called son of David. 
Others would speak of a, the Messiah of Joseph, Messiah Ben Joseph, or Messiah, the Messiah of Aaron or of Israel. There were there were different ways that Jews would talk about the Messiah. Some of these are overlapping. Some of these would be consistent. You could have more than one label for the figure. Uh, but some people would put these in different categories. And, and one of the categories that existed was the notion of Messiah as son of God. And this was a concept of the Messiah as a heavenly figure, not just a human being. And so when the high priest is asking Jesus, are you the Christ, the son of God? He's being specific. He's saying, are you the Messiah in that sense? Are you claiming to be the, the, the son of God? And how does Jesus reply? Ego emi. I am. He uses the divine self-asseveration formula. This is how God identifies himself throughout the prophets. It's a distinctive mode of discourse. God is saying he's the eternal one. And then Jesus furthermore says, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven, which was a reference, as you know, to Daniel 7, where this is what Daniel marvels at, is, is that there's this person who's approaching the Ancient of Days on the clouds of heaven. And the reason that's so interesting is because throughout the Old Testament, this is the way that God is described riding the, the divine chariot, if you will. He's, he's uh, described as riding the clouds. And this was something of a slap in the face at the, the god Baal, who is known as the cloud rider. So the Old Testament, taking a jab at the Baal worshippers, says he's the one who controls the clouds. But here's this human being approaching the Ancient of Days. So you have two persons. And by the way, this is one of the great texts that Jews interpreted as a reference to two divine persons. It's discussed in this book by Alan Segal. It's one of the texts that Rabbi Akiva interpreted as a reference to two persons, one of whom was the Messiah. And so Rabbi Akiva, remember, by the post-Christian Talmudic Jews, is being rebuked for holding this. So they're trying to get rid of this, suppress it, but it wasn't rejected by all pre-Christian Jews. So anyways, the, the point, though, is that the, the high priest is asking Jesus, are you claiming to be that one? And that's what is so disturbing to the high priest, because it can't possibly be this man that we're looking at is the very Son of God. And when Jesus says that he is that one, the high priest determines that this is blasphemy, which, in fact, I just watched the other day Ben Shapiro. I didn't know he had a discussion in the past with uh, William Lane Craig. Somehow I missed that. And at one point, I remember listening to, he, he was responding to William Lane Craig saying, well, the story of Jesus at his trial doesn't make any sense because he claims to be the Messiah, and then the high priest accuses him of blasphemy, but it wouldn't have been blasphemous to claim to be the Messiah. And then he brings up the very evidence that I would bring up for that. Bar Kokhba claimed to be the Messiah, turned out to be a false Messiah, but he wasn't accused of blasphemy for that, nor were those who believed in him as the Messiah, even though he turned out to be a false Messiah. That wasn't a blasphemy charge. It, would be, it could be wrong. You could be ridiculed for it, but you wouldn't be accused of blasphemy. So this is proof that the high priest understood this in a divine sense. And so when Jesus affirmed it, he's affirming that he is the Son of God, the very thing that Muslims don't believe. And this also ties in, as far as you were just pointing out, um, if they don't want to believe, as they don't, that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, even though you've got you've got like layers of problems there, like with their book affirming our book, telling us to judge by our book. Okay, we go to our book, and Jesus over and over again is affirming himself to be the divine Son of God. Uh, and so, how do you how do they get out of this? There's no way out of it except just by lying. Um, so you've got that, but then. The question arises, even if you even if you didn't know this, or even if you were even if you were doubting the Gospels and didn't believe in the ending of Mark, even if you don't believe in this stuff or don't believe that it's a reliable authoritative scripture, they acknowledge that the Jewish leaders wanted Jesus dead and believed that they had been, that they had succeeded in killing him. And so the question that automatically should arise is, if Jesus wasn't claiming to be divine, if he wasn't claiming to be Lord, if he wasn't claiming these things, what enraged them so much that they wanted to kill him for blasphemy? What is it? And Muslims have never been able to give an answer. I've had Muslims say, ah, but well, because he was claiming to be the Christ, as you point out, that's every that's all I've ever heard, that this is not a this is not a death penalty offense, that this is not a blasphemy offense. Um, and so it's just a big puzzle like everything else uh, in Islam 
just uh, no answers, no answers. Uh, and by the way, it's it's the same thing in the other gospel, so it's multiply attested. There's all kinds of things that factor in here. But John 19 says that the Jews, when Pilate wanted to release him, the Jews say, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. And so here's Mark, supposedly and the earliest gospel, supposedly the least theologically embellished and sophisticated, is saying the same thing John says. And, and you know, so yep. and and, he, and and Mark is actually saying it in a way that we know from Jewish sources that they actually that made sense, right? It it, it play, and in fact, let me reinforce this just a little more. Remember the account in Mark twelve. People love to cite Jesus quoting the Shema there. Remember the in, in Mark twelve, Jesus is is debating the Jews again, and he goes through the groups. He goes through the Herodians, the Sadducees, the Scribes, and the Pharisees, and they've all exhausted their efforts. They they've tried to put him in in a corner. He refutes them all, and now the text shows Jesus turning the tables and asking them a question. So Jesus says to them right after he quoted the Shema. You have to see the connection here. They ask him, what's the greatest commandment of the law? And he says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And right after that, so Jesus gives gives the right answer to them. Right after that, Jesus says, basically, I'll ask you a question. The Messiah, whose son is he? And they say, the son of David. And then Jesus says, well, how then does David, speaking by the Spirit, call him Lord? If he's David's son, how is he his Lord? Now, the point isn't to say he's not a descendant of David, but they obviously are thinking merely of Messiah, some of them, as the son of David and nothing more. And Jesus is saying that doesn't account for the totality of Scripture. Now, they could have been like contemporary Muslims and said, well, we only accept this verse and not that one. But they weren't like that, right? They accepted the whole of what God had revealed. And so they had to deal with Psalm 110, not just De Deuteronomy 6.4. And speaking of Muslims who are forced to uh, do some cherry picking when they go through uh, these things, by the way, it was interesting because uh, so we had our debates and then uh, Bobby from uh, Convert to Islam from uh, the channel Bobby's Perspective commented on it and uh, basically affirmed the entire methodology. He's like, hey, we go we go to the Bible and we pick out verses that agree with Islam. And if it agrees with Islam, well, that's that's good. We will stick with that. Anything else in the passage that contradicts Islam, we don't. We can believe that's that's corrupted, which is exactly the method that the uh, Muslim debaters were using. But it's just interesting. We pointed out this is a debate. They're supposed to be supporting their view with evidence, showing that their view is true. And we pointed out, okay, he start. He's saying we start by assuming that the Quran is true. <laughs> We start by assuming that, that the Quran is true and that Muhammad is a true prophet and that therefore Islam is true. And then we go to other texts and we can can pick out verses and so on and then ignore everything that doesn't uh, that doesn't agree with Islam because we've already decided that Islam is true. And so once they've done that, then they end up with just a bunch of passages in the Bible that support Islam and they've thrown out everything else. And then the conclusion is that the Islamic views of, of uh, various positions are true, that Muhammad's a prophet, that Jesus is a Muslim and so on. And it's just interesting that the Muslim debaters don't see a problem here. Uh, Bobby, from Bobby's perspective, doesn't see a problem here. Really, no Muslim apologist sees the problem here because they all do this. And yet, I just I asked people in the chat. I said, "Guys, what what's the problem here?" And uh, you had a you had a couple people bring up some uh, some some other suggestions and so on. But over and over again, people kept saying circular reasoning and and uh, and cherry picking, circular reason, cherry picking. And the Muslim debaters and and uh, and YouTubers and so on, they have no problem with it. It's like, yeah, our entire system is based on. Circular reasoning, begging the question, and cherry picking. And that's how we go to the Bible. And it's just interesting because, guys, you can defend anything using that method. I could go, if I'm a Buddhist and I want to go to the Book of Mormon to show that Joseph Smith was a Buddhist, I could do that using this method. And it's just, a, it should be a general rule. If the method that you're using to prove that Muhammad's a prophet and to prove that Jesus is a Muslim could be used to show that anyone is a prophet, or that anyone was anything, you probably need a new methodology and just have to say, if your, if your religion requires you to reason like that, you probably have a problem with your religion. All right, Anthony, so we want to actually uh, go to the Bible here. So what do you got for us? 
All right. So he, here's what I want to start off with. Uh, Genesis 1, 1 through 3. I think you have those verses. Now, everybody oh. should be familiar with this. This is the beginning of the Bible, mm -hmm. and it begins with that phrase, right? That pregnant phrase in the beginning, the same phrase that begins John's gospel. But here's what I want people to think about for a moment. Here you have it, God presented as speaking. He's engaged in the act of speaking. Verse, verse 3 says, God said. That statement recurs several times throughout the, the chapter. God said, in this case, let there be light, and there was light. So God speaks, what God says happens, and uh, then you have it repeated several times throughout the context. There's something like nine fiats that are that are given in Genesis, not to mention several times where it uses the phrase God called. So God called the day or the light day, and he called the, the darkness night. So the fact that God is speaking is already hugely significant. Speech is, in the very nature of the case, an act of expressing thoughts in articulate sounds, and it's inherently a personal and communicative act. Speech is something that persons do, and it's meaningless in an impersonal context. So it presupposes not only a person, but another person, somebody to whom that one is speaking. Now, this is just now, David here is the philosopher, and I'm going to drive this home with the text itself, but I just want people to think about this for a moment, just just the issue of speaking. But if you if you read the the philosophical works on on speech as a phenomenon, you'll you'll see this. They talk, for example, about interpersonal communication and intrapersonal communication. So interpersonal communication is when one person speaks to another, extrinsic to the individual. And intrapersonal communication is when you have a person engaging in internal dialogue. Now, what's interesting about this, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because I already know that many people are going to think, well, this doesn't have the significance that you seem to be driving towards. But what philosophers of language point out is that even when somebody's engaged in intrapersonal dialogue, they're assuming another person either somebody that they have spoken with or will speak with. It always presupposes another person. It's, it's an act that necessarily involves communication and therefore other persons. Now, uh, I want to read a quote here from Athanasius because he, he actually expresses this, I think, in a, in a way that is, is better than I'm capable of. But Athanasius was an early Christian, so this shows you that there's precedent for this early on in Christian history. And I'm going to show better than this, there's even precedent for this sort of thing in pre-Christian Judaism. But Athanasius says this, When he, God, was carrying out the creation of the heaven and earth and all things, the Father said to him, that is to his word, Let the heaven be made, and let the waters be gathered together, and let the dry land appear, and, and he quotes several times when God speaks, so that one must convict Jews also of not genuinely attending to the Scriptures. For one might ask them, to whom was God speaking? To use the imperative mood. So the, the idea is that God is issuing a, a command here. He's saying, let this be. Athanasius goes on, If he were commanding and addressing the things he was creating, the utterance would be redundant, for they were not yet in being. But we're about to be made, but no one speaks to what does not exist, nor addresses to what is not yet made a command to be made. For if God were giving a command to the things that were to be, he must have said, Be made heaven, and be made earth, and come forth green herb, rather than let there be, as, you know, as though he's talking to another. Now, so this is Athanasius. He, he makes this statement in his book Against the Heathen. So, all heathen, including Muslims, should listen up. It's chapter 46. A similar point is made by Hilary of Poitiers in his book, fourth book on the Trinity. So this is not just me making this point. But I, I mention this because it, it shows us that already you have this idea 
in, in the Bible, before you get to the pregnant verse 26, you already have this notion being broached. It's in verse 26, though, that what's in view, or what's implicit, comes more explicitly into view, right? So if you go down to verse 26, and this is a text that many people will be familiar with, and of course, I know the objections, and I'm happy to deal with these, but I, I, I just want people to follow along with me here for a moment. In Genesis 1.26, you have the famous statement, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and so forth. Here, what is implicit earlier, God addressing someone engaged in speech, becomes explicit. God now speaks in the plural. Now, somebody may want to say, well, how do you, if this, if all that you're saying is true, just the very act of speech presupposes personhood, in fact, multiple persons, how do you deal with the fact that the Quran presents Allah speaking, and even, most interestingly, speaking in the plural? Well, my contention would be that the Quran does this because it's aping the Bible. Muhammad often did things in the Quran without realizing how they did, they were, did not comport with the theology that he was making up. And, and so we have examples of that. Uh, for instance, Muhammad seemed to be opposed in some ways. Some aspects of his thought seemed to be uh, to seem to preclude the notion of God being imminent. And you, you see this in some versions of Islam where they say that Allah is not in this dunya, he's not in this earth, he's above the seven heavens, he's not present personally, but with his knowledge he's able to see from where he is. But what do you do when the Quran records Allah appearing or speaking to Moses at the right side of Mount Sinai? There you have Muhammad surreptitiously picking up a verse from the Bible and including it in the Quran, even though it doesn't fit well with his overall theology, and it, it creates huge problems for Muslims. Well, the same thing is true, I would argue, when it comes to Allah speaking, and especially when it comes to Allah speaking in the plural. Muslims are quick to say things like, well, this is just a plural of majesty. But the fact of the matter is, if you read the scholarship on this, for example, M.A.S. Abdel Halim, he's a Muslim scholar. He has his own translation of the Quran. He's written numerous journal entries and other yeah, things. He did the, uh, yeah, he, he did the uh, Oxford translation. Yeah. Well, M.A.S. Abdel Halim has a article called Iltifat, which is a reference to the strange phenomena in the Quran where it seems to banter back and forth between Allah speaking in the first person to Allah speaking in the third person to Allah speaking in the singular to Allah speaking in the plural, and often in a very dizzying way. You can't keep track of who's talking. It, it appears as though He's talking, then it appears as though somebody else is talking about him, but the whole Quran is supposed to be Allah's direct speech, so what is this? So M.A.S. Abdel Halim is trying to deal with that, and in the course of it, he points out that prior to the Quran, in the Arabic language, there's no such thing as a plural of majesty. And so you have to argue, if you're a Muslim, that it was introduced with the Quran. But then, what's the evidence that that's what's going on in the Quran? You have to look within the Quran or the Hadith literature to justify saying it's a plural of majesty. But here's the problem. When we look to the material that addresses this, it doesn't support that. For example, if you look at Ibn Yitzhak's Surat Rasul Allah, he, he records the instance of the Christians of Najran. This is in the last year of Muhammad's life. They come up to where Muhammad is in Medina, and they have dialogue with him, and they ask him a series of questions. They ask him, uh, who is Jesus' father? Uh, they ask him how Jesus performed miracles. And um, among other things, they ask him, if Allah is only one in singular, why does he speak in the plural, saying, uh, we decreed, we created, and so forth? And th here's, the, here's the interesting part about this. Notice the, the Christians of Nadran that are asking Muhammad this question, they're Arabs, right? They're Christians, but they're Arabs. They know Arabic. They're, they're not ignorant of Arabic. And, and if there was such a thing as a plural of majesty, they wouldn't have to ask this. It would be evident to them. But they think this is a problem. What's further problematic is when you continue in the story, in the Sirah, 
you continue in the story, Muhammad doesn't at first have an answer for them. He's flummoxed. He's he's caught, uh, you know, red faced, which is often the case in the sources, right? He's he's caught shame faced. He doesn't know the answer. Then he's supposedly given the first 80 verses of Surah 3. And then he comes back to them eventually with these uh, 80 verses, 80 plus verses. And the only thing that addresses this in Surah 3, 7, or in Surah 3 is verse 7, where it says some things in the Quran aren't so clear. And only Allah knows what that means. Right. And so that's, that's and that's, that's, and only... that's after and that's after an endless array of verses all telling us about how Allah bragging how clear his book is. This book is right. so clear. It's 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 so clear. How can you doubt it when it's so clear? Some Christians come along, ask some questions. Hey, uh, uh, what's going on here? And then it's, oh, well, yeah, but it's not that clear. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's a huge problem uh, because the Quran and this is in the last year of Muhammad's life. So. Muhammad had been saying that for 22 years, and then suddenly these Christians from Najran come up and the whole gig is up. What was always the case with the Quran, that it's clear, is now suddenly it exploded. Like, it, you know, just a few questions from some intelligent Christians. And it's almost like, you know, Christians uh, today uh, asking Muslims questions that, that just explode the whole narrative, right? The uh, the, for, for, for years, they were claiming the Quran has no variants, there's no differences, but then all it took was somebody scratching a little bit and, and suddenly the gig is up. All right, but that was just, that was a little bit of a detour. I was, you know, here I'm just pointing out that the reason you find this sort of thing in the Quran is because Muhammad is picking this up like crumbs off a table or like a dog picks up fleas from, from Jews who themselves don't have any better idea what's going on here at least not these post-Christian Jews that are interacting with Muhammad. But when we go back to the, the Bible itself and we ask, why is God speaking when that's an interpersonal activity? And then why does God speak in the plural? We, we have to try and answer this biblically. Now, when we look at the context of Genesis 1-3, or 1-1 through 3, if you go, you go back in the context, you already have one of those persons explicitly mentioned, right? In, in Genesis 1-2, right after it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, it says the Spirit of God, the Ruach Elohim, was brooding over the surface of the waters. Now, many people, because they, they don't want the Trinitarian implications to be already there in Genesis 1, They'll say that this should be translated a mighty wind. So you'll see that in some liberal translations and in, in some commentaries. But that's just not workable. It's, it's not true that this is how you should interpret that phrase. The, the phrase, it, well, first of all, if you wanted to say a mighty wind in Hebrew, you'd say something like ruach gedolah, which you see in Jonah 1 or Job 1. So that's, that's the phrase for mighty wind. You wouldn't say Ruach Elohim. Uh, Elohim is the word for God. And everywhere this phrase is used, the full phrase, Ruach Elohim, it always refers to the spirit and can't mean an impersonal wind. So, for example, in Genesis 41, we're told that Joseph interpreted the dream of Pharaoh Pharaoh, uh, what's interesting in the context is Pharaoh's wise men can't do this, but Joseph can. And because Joseph puts on display great wisdom and discernment, Pharaoh concludes that he's a man in whom dwells the Spirit of God. Now, it would make no sense to say that in Joseph there's a mighty wind. Right? That just that doesn't work, nor do any of the other occurrences of this phrase. It always refers to the Spirit of God. Now, that isn't to say that it doesn't carry with it this idea of, of power and so forth, but that's, that's not be, you know, because it's an impersonal wind, but, an, but actually the Spirit of God, who is the one who uh, is full of power. But what cinches this, well, there's, there's several things that cinch this, one is that it uses the phrase here that the Spirit was brooding over the surface of the waters. If you go to Deuteronomy 32, which I think you have pulled up, you have the only other occurrence of that phrase in the Bible. 
So you want hey, dirty, so, you want Deuteronomy thirty two up? Yeah, Deuteronomy thirty two verses ten and eleven. Now, what's what's interesting to set the context up is so this is the end of the Torah. So this is what scholars call an inclusio. That's where it, it's a literary device where something is stated at the beginning of a section and said at the end so that it envelopes everything in between it. And it's giving you something of a way of understanding what comes in between. So at the creation account, we're told that God created the world and then it was without form and void. He created heaven and earth and it was without form and void. And then through a series of successive fiats, he brought form uh, to it and he caused it to be inhabited. But part of that creation process is God causing the earth that was submerged in water. He caused the waters to part and the dry land to emerge. Well, here in Deuteronomy 32, in verse 1, God calls heaven and earth to witness. So again, you have this echoing of the Genesis account, right? He calls heaven and earth to witness, and he's referring back to his deliverance of the people at the Exodus. So he's reminding Israel what he did for them. What did he do at the Exodus? He delivered them through the parted waters of the Red Sea. He parted the waters and caused the dry ground to appear. So what I'm trying to get people to see is that there are allu allusions here back to Genesis 1. Just like heaven and earth were made in Genesis 1, here heaven and earth are called to witness. Just like God caused the dry land to appear in Genesis 1, here it's referring back to the Exodus where God parted the waters and caused the dry land to appear for Israel to cross through. But then if you go down to verse 10, notice what it says about God in relation to the people of Israel. In verse 10 it says, he found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of a wilderness. By the way, that phraseology, too, is from Genesis 1-2. In Genesis 1-2, it says that the earth was without form and void. Here, it's picking up the same language. It's translated differently in the NAS, but it's the same underlying Hebrew. It's referring to the, the conditions in the wilderness as similar to those primeval conditions before God formed and filled the world. So they're in the howling waste of a wilderness. And then it says he encircled him. He cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest that hovers or broods over its young. He spread his wings and caught them. He carried them on his pinions. So the point that I'm making here is that this term that functions as an inclusio with Genesis 1-2 is here used for God. And there it was used for the Spirit. It's not a term that's used for the Spirit that somehow impersonalizes him. It's used in, in only these two texts in the Torah, and it's, it's functioning then as an intertext. It, 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 they're mutually interpretive. In Genesis 1-2, it should be viewed as referring to the Spirit as God, even as here it's referring to God. So this is the first... Uh, person that I'm arguing is already present in the creation account. Now, by the way, the rest of the Old Testament bears witness to this. Anybody that wants to say that I'm engaging in some kind of fanciful exegetical maneuvering, which I'm not, this is standard if, if anybody reads the literature, the sort of thing I just pointed out is, is prevalent. But the Old Testament is explicit that the Spirit is the one who creates and preserves the world just as the father does it's for example in job 33 you don't have to pull that up but elihu said the spirit of god has made me so elihu the the one person in uh, the company of job's counselors who doesn't get a specific rebuke he said the spirit of god has made me and then again in psalm 104 30 if that's not good enough the psalmist says, you send forth your spirit and they are created and you renew the face of the ground. In uh, Job 34, verses 14 and 15, it says, if God should determine to do so, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, notice the spirit and the breath are distinguished here. If he were to withdraw from man his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together. The, the same idea is present in, in Genesis 6, where it says, the spirit will not always strive with man, for he is flesh. So the spirit won't continue to persevere with man because he's fallen, sinful, rebellious. So the spirit is portrayed as the source of life, the source of renewing the creation, the source of sustaining things. So when you read in the context that God is speaking, which presupposes communication, and then he says, let us make, 
you don't have to look outside the context. You don't have to import something from the Council of Nicaea. Muslims love to pretend that this is post-Christian. It's from Nicaea. You don't even have to import anything from the New Testament. You're on solid Old Testament grounds to identify one of those persons to whom God was speaking as the Holy Spirit. So I, I've got more to say, but maybe you want to break in or, or somebody has a question or, or whatnot. Yeah, there, there are a number of questions, and uh, uh, some of them you've, you've kind of uh, addressed already, but we'll go. I just wanted to point this out. This is awesome. <laughs> so we have a Muslim friend joining us and says, uh, you guys are more obsessed with Islam than Christianity. Why do you keep on taking and taking about Islam and Quran? Go to the Bible. You know Islam is true. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> so wait, wait, but notice this in light of the, the setup to this whole discussion. He's saying, if we weren't obsessed with Islam, if we were just being true to our Christian convictions, we'd be going to the Bible. Now, what is it you said all the Muslims were doing in your debates with them that when they're trying to establish their religion? They kept going to the Bible, right? Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so are they obsessed with the Bible? And uh, is that an indication that they're good Christians? Or, I mean, what is that supposed to mean? Yeah, and just the irony that we're sitting here going through the Trinity in the yeah. Old Testament, and he's saying, why are you talking about Islam and not going to the Bible? Go to the Bible. It's like, what, what, do, you, what do you see on your screen, dude? What do you see on, this, on the screen in front of your face? <laughs> yeah, and, and of course, this is a Christian channel. Why is he, you know, over here? He yep. could be listening to Islamic stuff. He's obsessed, apparently, with Christian channels. You're welcome to come and be obsessed with my channel too, Aslam. Yeah, uh, link to Anthony's channel is in the <laughs> description box. Uh, you can come over there, and anytime Anthony is going through the Bible and discussing Christian theology, you can go in there and ask him, well, why are you talking about Islam? Why are you talking about Islam? Uh, yeah, we're dealing with some yeah. some, some brilliant uh, some brilliant folks here. Uh, and then, of course, we know that Islam is true. By the way, a little, little side note on how important it is for them to go to the Bible. So now to prove that Muhammad was a true prophet, they go to the Bible, which they say is corrupted. To prove that Jesus was a Muslim, they go to the Bible, which they claim has been corrupted, even though their God and their prophet were not aware at all of this corruption that they keep talking about. But you think, gosh, how can they, si how can they simultaneously be saying the Bible is corrupted and then using it to prove everything they want to prove in any debate? And you think, well, why don't they go to their own book to prove stuff? But notice they've been they've been rejecting all the arguments about their own book, right? So they had perfect preservation for years, the miraculous preservation. Now they acknowledge that that was all a lie. It was it was just it was. Uh, I saw a Muslim scholar recently say that's that's a lie you tell to children, right? So it's, it became the dominant position in in the world. And he's like, yeah, it's just a lie that we we tell to children. Um, and then, of course, you have the scientific miracles. So notice, if, if Islam is confirmed by scientific miracles, well, that should be the uh, that should be the awesome proof right there. Uh, and now they acknowledge that's all aligned. So people are wondering why do these guys keep going to the Bible? Well, they're they're rejecting all the arguments that are actually based on their own religion. That's all been deceptive, and so they're going back to what Muhammad argued, namely, uh, I'm in the Bible. Find the proof there. And then, of course, when we go there, no, it's been corrupted. This is just awesome stuff. You wonder. I mean, if we could actually get it through to them, how insane this is to be a, constantly attacking a book and then using that book as your only defense of your own religion. Uh, wow. Then they would just literally have nothing, which is what they, uh, in fact, had. Um, all right. Couple super chats, because some of these are some of these just uh, comments and so on. But some of them uh, some of them are kind of related to the overall topic. And some of them were along the lines of what you were just talking about with uh, Genesis, but we'll zoom through these, uh, some of these. So uh, White Lily says, how did Jewish leaders convince so many Jews n to not believe in a plurality of persons? I find it fascinating how beliefs of God changed after Jesus. So um, based on what I've heard from you, Anthony, and uh, what I've seen in some quotations here and there and so on, uh, and you, you've already you've already talked about this. So early on, it was fairly common to have a Jewish belief. So at the time of Jesus, it's fairly common to believe in multiple, uh, what do you want to call them, persons or whatever, or powers or whatever uh, in heaven. And that once Christianity begins to spread, Jewish leaders want to set themselves apart from Christianity by emphasizing a unitarian position, and it seems like Lily here is just asking uh, uh, how, the, how do they pull that one off. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, it, first of all, it wasn't wholesale. They weren't wholesale successful. And that's something I pointed out earlier. That's what you're referring back to. So what, what happens is when, even when I say that this was a belief among second temple Jews, it doesn't mean that every Jew understood this, but it's very popular. So one of the sources for our knowledge of Jews who believed in a plurality of persons are the Targums, which represent popular Judaism. The Targums developed in the synagogues. So it's it's not just Sadducees or temple Jews who are believing this sort of thing, those that are attached to the, the officiating of the official temple cult in, in Jerusalem. Throughout the lands of, of Jews in, in Israel and in Babylon, this was a common feature of their belief system, but not every Jew would have believed that. After the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem and Israel being plowed up like a field, the the rabbis began to try and codify the religion, and it takes place over several centuries where they're they're preserving certain traditions, excising others, and and so in that context, people are are being influenced by this this uh, leadership that's that's sort of imposing this on them but even then there were jews as i mentioned that continued outside of the talmudic channels that continued to per perpetuate these ideas so i pointed out that uh, moshe Idel in his book ben uh, shows that this was the sort of thing that was you can find in medieval works where they still believed this nachmanides who's a famous medieval rabbi still believed this sort of thing uh, you have other Jewish scholars, Daniel Abrams points this out, Andre Olav points this out. It, it's, it's very well known that Jews continued to believe this, and it's, it's sort of a well-kept secret. I, I can't believe that people like Tovia Singer, for example, don't know about it. They, they just won't admit it, and they're hoping that Christians like myself won't bring it up. And it reminds me of a, it reminds me of a sort of similar issue in Islam, where I think people— um, I think people underestimate how much uh, leaders and you know worship leaders and scholars and so on, how much uh, control they can exercise over a population um, in terms of what to believe. But it's very similar in that we read the Quran and we're like, guys, the Quran all over the place is affirming the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of Jewish and Christian scriptures. And yet you go to, uh, almost any Muslim in the world will say, yeah, your book's been corrupted according to the Quran. We're like, what are you even talking about? Where did they get this? They didn't get this by reading the Quran. They got it by listening to their leaders, whereas their leaders, they know about all these passages affirming the Bible, but they know they can't. They kind of can't let the cat out of the bag or it's going to lead to all sorts of problems for them. And so they just have to kind of, no, 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 not what it says. And uh, so it, it seems like a similar situation that you're talking about the the Old Testament, which which uh, Jews believe in, and you're pointing out, hey, if you if you actually have a Unitarian position, what about this? What about this? What about this? This 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 and this. Um, so yeah, that's uh, it's interesting stuff. Um, by the way, I see I saw Solitary Emmy uh, became a member and then gifted. I'm not sure how the gifting of memberships works, but it looks like she did it, and then a bunch of other people. Uh, just instantly get the memberships. Guys, uh, I have a question for those of you who are uh, signed up because I just made I just made the channel. I just recently made a, the channel uh, memberships, uh, put that up because people requested it um, as a means of fun funneling uh, Mossad shekels to us. But uh, I did. I did want to release videos early. So basically, sometimes I post my, I upload my video the day before and then I make it live the next day. I make it public the next day. But I've been sending that link the day before um, to, you know, supporters on Patreon or to the Act 17 community. I'm going to do the same thing with channel members, but I don't know how you actually get it. Like I can send a message to people on Patreon. I don't know how you guys get the message. So anyway, tomorrow sometime might be the evening. I'm going to, no, it will be the evening. Tomorrow evening, I'm going to share a video for early release. It will be released uh, sometime this, it'll be public sometime this weekend or maybe on Monday or something like that. But uh, I'll send it out early to channel members. If you can, let me know how you get that because I don't know how you actually, like, do you get a notification or do you get a message sent to your email or does it just pop up when you're on YouTube? 
uh, let me know how you get that because I don't know. And I'm wondering how, uh, how you'll see that. Um, all right, a couple more super chats and then we'll get back to the text. Uh, Cliff says, ha, Mossad is not happy with this video, but is sending shekels anyway. <laughs> Great work, Anthony. This subject cannot be discussed enough. And yeah, I'm, I, uh, matter of fact, let me tie that. Let me tie that comment in with the uh, next super chat. Input latency says, I only just got here, but this already seems like a really long video to just say, yeah, lol, God bless nerds. So he's saying, why is it so long? We could just say yes. Uh, but yeah, tying this in with the um, with the comment from Cliff, this is very important. So this is important for Christians. This is an important topic for Christians. Like, is is the belief in the Trinity? Is that just something that started with the New Testament, or does it does the doctrine go back further than that? It's important for Christians who are having discussions with their Jewish friends. It's important for Christians who are having discussions with their Muslim friends, because we've seen over and over again, it's just standard uh, belief among Muslims that cre later Christians came up with this idea, and therefore it's not actually in the scripture, uh, period. And if it is at all, it's like from, from Paul or something like that. But the you know, they don't, they have no idea what's actually in the Old Testament. So yes, very, very, very important topic that uh, should be covered pretty regularly. And I encourage everyone to, if you're not uh, subscribed to Anthony's channel, uh, you got that in the description box again. Uh, what's the play to handle cherry picking? Claims like only Quran aligned verses count or only early books count can really hamstring your case. Well, yeah, but you, you point that out as a logical fallacy. And for some reason, they never, ever get it. If you're just pointing out, hey, you can't just go to the Bible and cherry pick. What are you doing cherry picking? What are you doing cherry picking? So it's usually helpful to just do it with the Quran. So go to Surah 9, verse 5, slay them wherever you find them and say, do you want us to read the context? Do you want us to read the historical background? Do you want to sit, do you, or, or do we just go with what a verse uh, says? And so you can point that out. And as we pointed out, uh, if you're having discussion with Muslims and they're saying we only we can only we can only use verses that align with the Quran, okay, then you're being circular. You're being circular. So, and then you point out, hey, why is all of Islamic apologetics based on fallacies? That any that anyone who studies fallacies at all, anyone with any familiarity with fallacies at all, would instantly spot. Uh, why is that? And so you want to bring that home and you want to draw attention to it. And when Muslims are doing it, you want to say, you want to say to everyone looking around, guys, look, look, he's acknowledging that this is fallacious reasoning and he's defending it. Uh, you have any other thoughts on this, Anthony? No, that's, that's the basic response. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and then of course, once, once they say just this part, not the context, really, they can't even support their own case. I, I know on the one hand, they have to do that if they're going to make it even appear to support their case. But if you really press them, once they've taken away the context, you lose everything. You can't, you can't say, like, for example, Deuteronomy 18.15 or 18.18, their favorite go-to text for Muhammad as a prophet in the Bible. You, you, you don't know who's talking there. You don't know who he's talking to there. You don't, I mean, you lose everything. And so th they're trying to play, they're even pulling the wool over their own eyes. They think yeah. that they're proving more than they're actually proving. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, it's funny, uh, God logic actually, uh, pointed this out, uh, in, in the debate where they were saying <laughs> they're quoting John five thirty, and we're saying, just, hmm. just, just go right before that. Just go right before them and saying, no, this is, we can believe that that's all been corrupted. And finally, God logic is like, how do you even know who's speaking there? It doesn't say it does. It doesn't tell you that it doesn't tell you what this is about. It doesn't tell you what he's, when he says, uh, uh, the will of him who sent me. How do you know who sent him? How do you know who's talking? Who sent him? Who this is talking about? You only know from these preceding verses what you are saying uh, are corrupted. And so, yeah. It's, <laughs> it, it reminds me, I used to work at a Christian bookstore and this lady came in one day and she kept saying, I want a red letter Bible St. James edition. And I thought, who's St. James? I mean, I knew who she meant, but it was weird. So I thought there's something going on here. And I kept, I pressed her a little bit just to figure out what was happening. And, and she said, I just want what he said. I don't want what anybody else said. And she kept saying red letters, just the red letters, not the black. And I said, but ma'am, I said, it's the people who gave us the black letters that also gave us the red letters. It, it, it's nonsensical. The It's the apostles who are recording for us what Christ said. So 
you know, to, to dismiss the apostles as unreliable and say Jesus is the only one we're going to listen to, and only those parts of Jesus, right? It just yeah. it doesn't make any sense. You, you don't have the prologues of the books. You don't have the epilogues. You don't, and none of the contextually necessary factors are yeah. there once you do that. And it's just really, it's absolutely insane to say, oh yes, verse 17, that was written by a liar, a corrupter. Uh, verse 18, that was written by a liar. Verse 19, by a liar. Verse 20, liar. Verse 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, liar, 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 liar. Verse 30, oh yeah, that's good. That's good revelation, perfectly preserved and, and can be trusted. It's like, oh my goodness, guys, you can prove anything. We, Anthony, could we prove that Muhammad was a Christian who believed in the in the triune God of Scripture by using that method in the Quran? Could we do that? Oh, absolutely! I all could show day long. Allah. Yeah, yeah. I was Matter of fact, to start doing it. I got a little carried we, away there first. We should have. Yeah, I knew you would. We should have a show <laughs> where we do where we use their method. So we'll just stick with uh, circular reasoning and cherry picking, and we'll go through the Quran. We'll prove that Christianity is true, and maybe we'll prove that a bunch of other things are true using the exact same method. You know what, since some, some Muslims will, if they were to watch such a video, wouldn't have also necessarily watched this one. I, I wonder how it would go off if we played like we were serious. You know, oh, we, yeah. don't, we don't tell anyone oh, what yeah. we're doing. Yeah. We, we just, just do it dead serious. Muhammad. Oh my goodness, you see, Muhammad was a Christian. He was a Christian. <laughs> this is proof. It's proof right here. And let them complain. And then we do the follow-up show where we say, listen to your complaints, guys. Because now you know how we feel every time you guys talk about the Bible. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, let's see. Another example is the Talmud. This is this comments from uh, Super Chess from earlier. Uh, said another example is the Talmud didn't exist at the Second Temple period. Modern Judaism isn't the parent of Christianity. Both are branches of the same trunk. So. Christianity is not an offshoot of modern modern Judaism. It's both modern Judaism and Christianity trace their uh, roots back to the same scriptures. That is, yeah, you agree yeah. With so that? so Christianity is older than Talmudic Judaism, and and no scholar of Judaism would deny that there's something distinctive and different about post Christian Judaism. They they had to readjust, if for nothing else the fact that the temple was destroyed. The temple was central to all of Judaism. You don't really have the same religion without it. So even the Jews, prior to the Roman destruction of the temple, when the Babylonians had destroyed it, in that period, they, they still had to try and uh, do as much as they could as though the temple were still standing. So for example, you see Daniel the prophet facing towards Jerusalem as if the temple's still there while he's praying. Right. But the, the Jews after the, the second temple was destroyed, this was more radical because here, here's the problem. When you look in the Old Testament to the first destruction, the prophets pre-announced it. They said it was going to happen and they told the Jews why it was going to happen. They specified the reasons God was going to allow the Babylonians to destroy the temple. And they told the Jews how long this was going to last, while, how long it was going to be that the temple would be destroyed. So this is this shows God's modus operandi. That's why Amos says God does nothing without revealing it to his servants, the prophets. So here's the million dollar question for Jews. Why was the second temple destroyed? Where did this receive prior announcement? Who, who announced this among the prophets? Who told you how long the desolation was going to last? Right? How do you know what you're supposed to repent of so that God can restore this situation to you? So the Jews after this knew th this is a problem. This is a huge problem. In fact, they even it's still there in the Talmud, numerous places, that the Messiah came or had to have come during the Second Temple period. There are numerous prophecies that tie his coming to the Second Temple. So some Jews today will say things like, G uh, the Messiah did come, but we weren't worthy, so he's hiding. Right, So he's been hanging out for 2,000 years. Right, They come up with with wild views, but uh, but yeah, the point is that the, the religion changed radically after the coming of Christ and the destruction of the temple, and this is one of them. Their their views on the persons of the Godhead. Uh, John here says, uh, "Hi, David. I'm from Venezuela, and I watch your videos uh, from Bogota, Colombia. I know English, but you could reach a lot of people if you could share your videos with CC in Spanish. Don't know Spanish, my friend, but." Uh, any of these Spanish speakers who ever watch my videos, keep in mind you have my full permission to take my videos 
Uh, you can you can translate them for yourself. You can re-record them as you speaking in Spanish. You do not need to give me any credit at all. I do not care. You can do that. Or uh, if that doesn't work, uh, anyone who wants to take my videos, add Spanish subtitles, repost them on their own channels. You can do that all day long. Uh, Solitary Emmy here said the third book. <laughs> so Emmy said he uh, he um, got the first two books. And then the third book that Anthony Rogers recommended is $270 for hardcover. No Kindle. By the way, I'm a man. Ah, he goes. Oh, OK. I didn't know Emmy was short for Emmanuel. That's interesting. OK. okay. So, well, let me just say this. When I bought this book, it wasn't $270. You could be sure. uh because <laughs> when I got it, I was in seminary, and David can tell you I was not rolling in the dough like Scrooge McDuck. I recall back then I was buying all your books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that's part of why David could tell you. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be at a conference, and uh, Anthony would be like, "Hey, what's my book allowance?" I'd be like, "Okay, just go grab some books." <laughs> it was great. Those were the days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Eric says, question for the Trinitarians. If I only worship the Father, not Jesus, would I go to hell? Um, now, I, uh, I'm i not as confident as Anthony to speak on some of these things. Um, I, I wonder, you know, I go to I go to presentations and uh, they talk about people in, in all kinds of different situations and knowledge and what's their, what they're responsible and so on for. But uh, even in the, the passage that we were just talking about, John 5, you've got things like Jesus saying, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And so, uh, yeah, but what are your thoughts on that, Anthony? Well, well so that, that verse by itself already, I mean, you could, you're could you bracketing the notion of what happens to such a person. I, I'll just make this observation here so that we're not too caught up in that whole discussion. But the, the point that Jesus makes shows that a person is not worshiping the Father if they're not worshiping him. He, he says that all must honor the Son just as they honor the Father. And in the rest of John's Gospel, he, he makes it clear that if you don't honor him, you're not honoring him who sent him. And so the equivalent honor is to be rendered to Jesus that is rendered to the Father. So whatever honor looks like in, in reference to the Father, it needs to look like that in reference to the Son. And, and so it's the same thing when Jesus says things like, unless you believe in me, right? You don't believe in him who sent me. So whatever the faith is, you know, the point I'm making here is that it, from Jesus' perspective, the true worship that is to be directed to him is necessary if one is to think that they're also worshiping the Father. And, and to bring this back into connection with our topic, Interestingly enough, and I don't know if we'll get there or not, but down the line, as if, if we continue to talk about the Trinity in the Old Testament, we would eventually get to the figure of the angel of the Lord, who is everywhere identified as a divine person. And the Old Testament is explicit that you're not to offer sacrifice to anyone but God. So while there are certain things that might blur the lines and you don't know, you know, is this person prostrating? Is that an act of worship or not? But one thing that's clear in the Old Testament is sacrifices are to be rendered only to God. And when you look at Judges 6 and Judges 13, the angel of the Lord is worshipped by means of sacrifice. So biblically, worshipping not just the Father, but the other members of the Godhead is, is very clear. And so you're pointing out Old, Old Testament as well. Yeah. Um, all right, let's see. We'll go through a couple more of these and then jump back into the text. What text did you want to go to next? Um, well, so back to Genesis one, when we do that, okay. you'll see All right. why. Uh, let's see. Hey guys, I was reading a non, you already addressed this. Matter of fact, this, this was from before you addressed it, but, uh, uh Hey guys, I was reading a non-Trinitarian article stating, uh, that the us used in Genesis refers to God's majesty, not plurality. Want to recap okay. your point there? Yeah. So I didn't say as much as I could have, but, uh, and I'll have more to say too, on a little bit different point, but number one, the very fact that God is speaking already demands the, a question, you know, demands that we address ourselves to this issue. Why is the God of scripture portrayed as a speaking being? Speech is a communicative act. When you get to verse 26, he speaks in the plural. Why is he speaking in the plural? And, and why, think about this for a moment. Just, just think, you know, analytically here for a moment. If God is absolutely one in the sense that he's one only and not a plurality in some sense, 
why would speaking in the plural be a way of indicating majesty? Wouldn't speaking exclusively in the singular be the way of indicating that? If the ultimate being is absolutely one, why do people not necessarily think in terms of plurality when they try and think of majesty and fullness? See, in the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, we have a footing for that, but I don't see how it makes sense outside of that context. Uh, when, by, when the, by the way, England, just, and, yeah, I just wanted to point out that this is a problem because you're you're addressing the issue from Genesis, but uh, everyone should keep that in mind for Islam, as you are pointing out the these plural pronouns in the Quran, where Allah is we this, we that, we this, we that, we this, we that. And we ask our Muslim no, friends, you? what is that? Well, that's the plural of majesty. It's the plural of majesty. And as you just pointed out, what's being assumed there in that response? that it's somehow more majestic to be plural rather than a than some unitary being. It's more majestic to be plural. So the Muslims actually have to say that Allah is this, as you would say, a monad. He's this unitarian deity who uses the plural of majesty, which isn't true. He, he, he's not actually it's like, plural. It's like he's like Muhammad pl Hijab, trying to stick out his chest, right? Yeah, he's bragging he's about like, being plural, calling himself plural because this is more majestic. So he's not the most majestic uh, being imaginable. If it's more, if it's understood by Allah from all eternity, if he's using these plural pronouns, he understands that it's actually greater and more majestic to be plural rather than uh, th this unitarian deity. Then and and yet Islam also constantly emphasizes that that there's there's one there's got to be one God there's got to be one God you can't have more than one God then according to the Quran itself the greatest deity would be one God who's multiple persons interesting interesting but yeah go ahead you were about to talk about the Queen well yeah I was just going to say that some people don't know like when you see the introduction of this and and there there'd be different periods when it was introduced into different lands and and languages but when you see this sort of thing that one of the famous examples is the queen of england when she quipped uh, we are not amused but in that original context she's referring to herself and the ladies of the court she's actually referring to a plurality along you know a retinue her retinue and so it's actually historically problematic at least if you're looking at english but it would be problematic in other languages as well when you look to the origin of these things but anyways the real problem here biblically or, or exegetically textually is it's one thing to say that there's a plural of majesty when it comes to nouns like elohim or adonai but in hebrew verbs and participles and pronouns that there's no such thing as a plural of majesty in hebrew okay i've had several years of hebrew i have the literature i could easily quote the scholars i have Scholars on the top of my head that I, I know have explicitly addressed this, Taylor Lewis, Emil Rodiger, Gesenius, the father of all Hebrew lexicons. There's no such thing as a plural of majesty when it comes to verbs, pronouns, participles in Hebrew. When you look at Genesis 126, when it says, let us make, here, here's the interesting thing. There's an interesting thing about it. it. The word for make is singular. But it has embedded the the subject. So in Hebrew, you have you have the the word, but the subject is often part of the word. So it's added to the word or the form of the word. And so it says make, but it's let us make. It's cohortative. So it's a form of mild exhortation. And that's so. But, but my point here is, it's a verb. Let us make is a verb in Hebrew. And you don't have the plural of majesty being used with, with verbs in Hebrew. That's just not a phenomena of the language. But think about this. It's not the only... I only pointed to Genesis 126 because I wanted to show some context, contextual things. But if you go to Genesis 3.22, it says, Behold, the man has now become like one of us. This construction is inconsistent with the plural of majesty. You, you have the Hebrew word memenu, one of us it's it's part of it. it's it's saying one of this group right he's becoming like one of us that's not the way you'd express a plural of majesty but think again about another passage genesis 11 7 god says come let us go down and there confound their language contextually this is a response to the tower builders the tower builders say in defiance of god's command to increase and multiply and fill the earth 
They say, no, let's all stay here and build a tower to our name and fame. And, and so they say, let us build a tower. Let us build. In fact, it's the same Hebrew expression, let us make. They say, let us make a tower. And God says, let us go down and confound their language. So here's the question. Was it just one man that was trying to build a tower up to heaven in Shinar? <laughs> right? Because it says, let us, and that's just a plural of majesty. And God is responding to that. So contextually, why aren't the, the phrases being used in the same way? So the point is that that sort of thing doesn't exist in Hebrew, not when it comes to verbs and participles. And there's a lot more I could say to that, but uh, I think that's sufficient for now. Uh, right. So you want to go back to the text now? All right. So actually, uh, let's go to Genesis 3, because what I pointed out before is that throughout Genesis 1, God speaks, which is a personal activity, and it presupposes other persons because speech is communicative. Moreover, Genesis 1.26 makes this explicit that God is addressing others. He says, let us make man in our image. Then I showed that contextually, we have an explicit mention of another person whom God would have been addressing, because the whole theology of the Old Testament endorses the fact that the Spirit is creator. The Spirit made man, Job 33, Job 34. The Spirit is the one who renews creation and creates things, Psalm 104, 30. So this is an Old Testament fact, and the Spirit's explicitly mentioned in Genesis 1. Now what I want to show is, and we're going to come back to Genesis 1 to fill out the, the story here, but what I want to show is the interesting fact that in the Old Testament, and this is not unique to Christians, certainly not unique to me, in the Old Testament, it begins to reveal something about God's Word that goes beyond thinking of it as a bare utterance. And the first one evidence of this is found in Genesis 3.8. So, uh, interest, uh, the, I was wondering how, I forgot how the NAS translates this, but I'll, I'll have to disagree with the translation here. In Genesis 3, you have the fall of man, and then we're told that God is coming to them subsequent to their fall into sin. And then verse 8 says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Now, this is, once again, problematic for Muslims just on the face of it. Here you've got God present with them in the garden, but Islam precludes God appearing in time and space, and certainly precludes the idea of God walking. This presupposes that God has condescended and even assumed something like a human form. We're not explicitly told the form here, but he's engaged in walking. But the, the real thing I want to draw people's attention to is what the Hebrew text says. The Hebrew text says they heard the voice of the Lord God, the kol Yehovah Elohim. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. Okay, It doesn't say they heard the voice speaking. It's, it's talking about the voice, and the voice is the subject engaged in walking. So this is why, if you look at the Jewish Targums, and I'm going to quote some Targums here in a, in a bit on Genesis 126, but when you look at the Jewish Targums, the way they render this is they say that this is the Logos, that they actually use the Aramaic form of this, the Memra of the Lord, the Word of the Lord, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So according to Jewish interpretation, they recognize this phrase is suggestive that God's word is not just an utterance, but an actual entity. And, and you have this sort of thing all over Scripture. In fact, if you go to Genesis 15, it's more, uh, I think, uh, pointed in a, in a certain way. But uh, as you're turning there, just think of many passages where it talks about God's word as though it's an active agent. So, for example, in Isaiah, the prophet says, God sends forth his word, and it doesn't return to him without accomplishing the purpose for which the word was sent. So the word is portrayed as being sent forth by God, engaging in some activity, and then returning to God. Why does Scripture speak that way? Now, you might want to just put it down to a personification of some attribute of God or something like that, 
but what I'm going to show you is that's not adequate. And in any case, the Jews didn't think of it that way either. So I'm not out on a limb here. But here's Genesis 15. Hey, one second. Is, hey, one second, yeah. Anthony. I just wanted to point out, uh, going with the King James here of <laughs> Genesis 3, 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So they heard yeah. the voice. They heard the voice walking. So there you have it. 1611, only way to heaven. <laughs> Uh, sure, yeah, so um, I'm sure modern translation. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so in Genesis 15 1, notice what it says. It says, These things, or wait, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Now follow this carefully because what people do is they too often just breeze over a text like this. They don't sit and, and think through what's being stated. It doesn't say, that God appeared to Abraham in the dream and spoke to him, though I think this is a divine person. But what it says is the word of the Lord came to him in a vision saying. So it's the word here that came to Abram, and it's the word here that spoke to Abram. right? And then Abraham in verse 2, or Abram, he's not yet, uh, he, his name is not yet changed. He, 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 he addresses the person as the Lord God. And then if you look in verse 4, again, it says, Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying. Now, once again, this is the sort of thing that Jews looked at and saw as evidence that the word of God is not merely an utterance or a sound that hits the eardrum, but is an actual entity or person. It is a person who speaks, who walks, who is sent forth and can return to God. And so that's why throughout the Targums, you have, in fact, uh, you can take that off the screen. I'll just read this for a moment. I, I want you to hear what the, the Targums say in Genesis one twenty six, And then I'll, I'll tie this in with some uh, other stuff in, in the Old Testament. But this is, there, there's many different Targums on the Torah. So the Torah is the first five books of the Bible, the Law of Moses. And you've got a number of Targums. So you've got what are known as Babylonian Targums because there was a Jewish, thriving Jewish community there of learned scholars. And there's out of that context, you get the Targum of Onkelos. And then you've got a lot of uh, J Jerusalem type Targums, such as Targum Neophyte, which is what I'm going to read, or Targum Pseudo Jonathan, or the fragmentary Targums. But here's what, listen to this. This is, th this ought to just end all claims of anti-Trinitarians, inclusive of Muslims, that the Trinity is a Christian innovation uh, or something you know, either imposed by the Council of Nicaea or maybe at best by Paul. But listen to what this says. This is a, the, the Targums, for those that don't know, are Jewish translations into Aramaic, which was a sister language of Hebrew, they're translating it into Aramaic for the benefit of people that came to speak Aramaic in during the Babylonian captivity. So even those that returned from Babylon to Israel would, would speak this language, which isn't to say that they didn't also speak Hebrew, but uh, here's what Genesis 126 says. Now, listen to this carefully. It says, and the Lord said, so it's the Lord who's speaking, let us create man in our likeness, similar to ourselves. And let them rule over the fishes of the sea and the birds of the air or the heavens and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And the word of the Lord created the man in his own likeness. The word of the Lord, notice, so there's a second person. The Lord said, and now we see the, the, the memra is the Aramaic term. In Hebrew, it's debar. In Greek, it would be logos. The Logos created man in his own likeness, in the likeness from before the Lord, he created him, male and his partner, he created them. And the Shekinah, or the glory of the Lord, blessed them. And the word of the Lord said to them, be strong and multiply. And the Shekinah of the Lord said, behold, I have given you all the herbs. So now notice this, you've got three figures here. You've got the Lord, his word, and his glory, his Shekinah. For those that don't know, in the Targums, Shekinah is a way of referring to the Spirit in many contexts. Now, what's further interesting here is in, in Genesis 
it says in in the Hebrew text, as it's normally translated, it says, "Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all all their uh, their hosts." But in in Hebrew, when you write when when you write in Hebrew, if you're a native speaker, you don't use vowels, right? The vowels are something that are added for the benefit of people that aren't native speakers. The, the prophets, Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they all just wrote in consonants, and you would have to know as a native speaker what vowels are to be supplied there. What's interesting is that sometimes the post-Christian Masoretes, who are Talmudic Jews, the post-Christian Masoretes often, in, they, they mentally inserted, and then even actually inserted, different vowel pointings than were assumed by earlier Jews, in some cases, not in all cases, but... In Targum Neophyte, there, there, it's the same consonantal text, but here's how they read it with, with the, the different vowel pointings. And they completed the creation of the heavens and the earth and all their hosts. So Targum Neophyte ascribes creation and the plural language used there to the Lord, his word, and his Shekinah. And then it says they completed the creation. So this shows you how they understood God's word. In fact, uh, if I were to go back in the in the Targum of Neophyte to Genesis 1, listen to how they begin the first verse. From the beginning, with wisdom, the memra, or the word of the Lord, created and perfected the heavens and the earth. And the earth was waste and unformed, desolate, and then it talks about the Spirit of God. So here, according to the ancient Jews, they understood from Genesis that there were three persons involved in the creation of man, and they saw evidence of that in the very first three verses of the text, even before you get to verse 26. Now, here's what sort of drives this home. This is what's behind some of this. If you go to Proverbs 8, uh, this text in Proverbs 8 was a hugely significant text in the mind of ancient Jews relevant to the interpretation of Genesis 1. So you have all these texts that I was bringing up and others that talk about God's Word as a person. Well, another way that the Old Testament speaks of this figure, as the Jews understood it, was by calling this figure God's wisdom. Okay, so if um, you go down to verse 22, well, as, as you're doing that, there are three times in the book of Proverbs where wisdom is not only spoken about, but actually speaks. So in Proverbs 1, one of the things that wisdom says is, if you turn to my reproof, I will pour out my spirit upon you. So notice that wisdom speaks according to Proverbs. And I'll be happy to address the objections that I know fill people's minds here. There, there are all sorts of things that people think are good responses to this, but let me assure you, they aren't good responses. But wisdom speaks there. Wisdom refers to the Spirit as my Spirit, and wisdom claims the prerogative to pour out the Spirit. Now, for those familiar with the Old Testament, you, you have to concede this is the way that the Spirit is usually spoken of in relation to God. The Spirit is the Spirit of God. The Spirit is poured out by God. So why is wisdom here speaking, and speaking in a way that is otherwise only consistent with deity? Well, when you get to verse 22, now note the language carefully. It says, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. Now, no translation is perfect, but this should be the Lord possessed me, and then, comma, the beginning of his way. Bereshit uh, darko. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's another way of talking about this figure. He's called the beginning, okay? the principium, the, the source of everything. So the, the speaker here is wisdom, contextually, and wisdom says, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his works of old, so before creation, but wisdom was already present with God. And then it says, from everlasting I was established, from the beginning. Now note the echoes of Genesis here. This is why the Jews thought this was so particularly relevant to Genesis 1, because it's picking up terms from Genesis. It's not just referring to creation, but it's referring to it in the way that Genesis 1 does. 
So if you, if you go through the context, it uses the word beginning. It uses the word heaven, it uses the word earth. It uses the words, uh, the, the, the great deep, right? The, the to home. And it says the spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the waters and, and uh, uh, darkness was over the deep, right? So here wisdom speaks and says, wisdom says, I was there from everlasting. Now, especially significant is verse 24 and verse 25. In the, in the English translation, it says, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. The actual Hebrew here is an idiomatic way of referring to this one as begotten. This one says, when there were no depths, that is before any created thing, I was begotten. Okay, this is a everlasting reality. I am the begotten of the Lord. By the way, there's, there's not only echoes here of Genesis, there are echoes of Psalms and other prophetic statements about the Messiah. So, for example, the, the phrase used in verse 23 about this one being established is only used in this form for the Messiah in Psalm 2, where it says uh, that he's established this one as king on Zion. So, uh, this, and, and also, Psalm 2-7 refers to this one as begotten, right? The Messiah, the Son of the Lord, is the begotten one. Well, here in Proverbs 8-24, he says, I was begotten. In verse 25, he says, I was begotten, right, before the hills. In fact, uh, I love this expression because it, it easily reminds one of Psalm 90. Here it says in verse 25, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was begotten, right, or I was, uh, I was birthed. Well, in Psalm 90, it says, before uh, uh, the mountains became, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So here it's saying the same thing about wisdom. Now, I could go on with, with this text, but go down to verse 30. But by the way, by the way, Anthony, it's just, uh, it's just interesting here that you're saying that this refers to, um, to the word being begotten, which to us always sounds temporal, like, like giving birth at some point, And yet it's also saying from everlasting, I was established. And yeah. so it's kind of like eternal, <laughs> eternal generation. Right. It's exactly, yeah, the Christian view. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in verse 30, it says, Then I was beside him as a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. So here, here's what's interesting, and you can take it off the screen now, but here, here's what's interesting about this. There, there's actually a lot of things that are interesting about this. First of all, there's all these echoes of Genesis. This, this makes it what you would call intertextual gold. I have a book here from uh, Boyarin called Intertextuality and the Reading of Midrash. And what he points out is that ancient Jews understood the text to be a unified text so that later texts were relevant to the interpretation and meaning of earlier texts. And they could be mutually in informative, especially when they pick up distinctive language. So sometimes the Bible will only use a word in two places, and then you have to think, you should be thinking, maybe these two places are relevant to each other. And this becomes all the more true when you have a cluster of words that are only used together in certain contexts. It becomes suggestive. Maybe these two texts are, are talking about each other. Well, in Jewish thinking, the Torah was especially unlocked by the writings of Solomon, you know, the book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, and the book, the Song of Solomon, book that we, we think is not especially important. It's, it's only important for some Christians when we're refuting Muslims on so Song of Solomon, verse five, or chapter five, right? But, but the, or, uh, you know, maybe in some other context. But the fact of the matter is ancient Jews thought that in these texts, you're being given some interpretive keys to the Torah. And uh, so as an example, uh, they, I, I wish Christians would get a hold of this, but in, in Ecclesiastes 1.9, it makes the statement, what has been will be again. The way Christians read that is saying, well, stuff happens that's happened before. Uh, we should learn lessons from the past. And, and I, it's true. I mean, we should learn what, what, you know, lessons from the past. And we do see things that happen again that we could have learned if we paid attention to what had happened before. But here's how the Jews read that. They understood that to be a reflection on the Torah saying what's being stated in the Torah is a, for, uh, a preview of what God is doing in the world and intends to do in the future. So they read, for example, when they looked at Moses, 
they said, what we're seeing here in the case of Moses is a picture of the second Redeemer. So the, the same books, the, the, the Midrash on the Song of Solomon, on Ecclesiastes, on Proverbs, they begin by saying things like, as it was in the case of the first Redeemer, so it will be with the second Redeemer. Or as it was with the first Exodus, so it will be with the second Exodus. And the reason that's significant is because the prophets, when they begin to talk about the coming Messiah, they use Exodus language. And when Jesus comes on the scene in the New Testament, they use Exodus language. Like, and we don't see some of this, but for example, you know, why is it that Jesus in, in the Gospels, is, uh, think of Mark's Gospel, in, in a lot of things happen on, uh, at the sea, the, the, the sea in Galilee. What's in, some scholars will claim that Mark is inaccurate because he keeps calling it a sea when it's really a lake. But Mark is intentionally calling it a sea because he's trying mm. to evoke the Exodus. Right. And, and what is Jesus doing? He's showing his power over the sea. He's delivering the disciples from the sea. So in, in Mark 4, for example, and, and I mean, again, it boggles the mind. Uh, in Mark 4, Jesus delivers the disciples from the sea. The sea is raging and he delivers them from it. And then after that, in, in Mark chapter 5, he, he delivers a, the Gerasene demoniac from a legion of demons. Right. Well, what is a legion? A legion is a armitary, uh, uh, excuse me, a military unit, right? It's the way you refer to a group uh, in an army. Well, what does Jesus do with this army of demons? He casts them into pigs. They go down a cliff and they're drowned in the sea. This should sound like a familiar story. Mm -hmm. Delivering the people through the waters, destroying a legion of enemy forces in the sea. And then what does he do after that? He goes into the wilderness with a group of thousands of Israelites, and he miraculously feeds them. It's the pattern of the Exodus, right? God delivered the people from Egypt. He destroyed Pharaoh's legions in the sea, and then he fed them in the wilderness. And then in Exodus, they go up the mountain, Mount Sinai, and there Moses receives the Ten Commandments and so forth. And he tells Moses on that occasion to listen to the angel of the Lord who's going to go before them, right? Well, what happens in Mark's account? After Jesus delivers them from the sea, destroys the legion of, of demons, feeds the, the thousands, he takes them up a mountain and he's transfigured before them. The father descends in a cloud and he says of Jesus, listen to him, just like he said about the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. So this is all Exodus stuff. So my point is just to say in these texts, in, in these books, like Proverbs and so forth, the, the Jews thought they were particularly relevant to the interpretation of the Torah. And so when they got to Proverbs 8, they thought Genesis 1. This is talking about Genesis 1. But notice what the wisdom of God is referred to as there. He's called the beginning, just like God and the prophets is called the beginning and the end, or the first and the last. It's not a way of saying God has a beginning. It means he's the the origin of everything, the source of everything. It, it, with him, everything has its you know, beginnings. So when you go back to Genesis 1, the Jews understood that in light of Proverbs, we are to understand that it's talking there about God's wisdom as one of the persons with whom he is creating everything. And he's literally called there in Proverbs a master workman or a master craftsman. Now, a couple of other things, there's a lot more that could be said, I could go on for days, but here's what's really, really cool about a lot of this. Now think about it. In, in Genesis 1, 1 through 3, you have an allusion to God's wisdom there by reference to the word beginning, because it, it's evoked by Proverbs 8, where wisdom is called the beginning of everything, and then a reference to God's spirit. So here God's word or wisdom and spirit are con, you know, uh, in conjunction with each other at the very beginning. Remember I quoted Gen Genesis 41 where it talks about Joseph who is full of wisdom and he, he's endowed with the Spirit. W Joseph is a type of Jesus, isn't he, in the Old Testament? Who else besides Joseph is so much a type of Christ? There, there are other great types, Isaac, others. Joseph stands out, though. There, there's nobody more like Jesus than Joseph. Well, what do you see with Joseph? First of all, he's the favored son of his father. But he, he goes to his brother. He's, he's sent by his father to his brothers. They despise him. They betray him. They want to kill him. 
but you can't have Joseph literally dying in the story because he has to be alive for the rest of it. But he's figuratively killed. They cast him into a pit and then they they take his coat and they put the, they, they, they kill an animal, a goat, and they put the blood on it, and take it back to their father. And then the father assumes that his son is dead. And what happens to Joseph in this time period? Joseph is exalted to the right hand of Pharaoh, the ruler over the world at the time. So here's this man who's endowed with the, the spirit, who's full of wisdom, who's now uh, who is the favored son of his father, but exalted to the right hand of Pharaoh. Starting to look like Jesus, isn't it? When you go through the Bible, re remember when Moses went up the mountain, he not only received the Ten Commandments, but the instructions for the tabernacle. But there was a person that God especially singled out to construct the tabernacle or oversee it, a craftsman. There was a craftsman who God chose named Bezalel, whose name means in the shadow of God. And we're told that he was filled with the spirit of God and wisdom in order to construct the tabernacle, the tent in which God would dwell. So you should start to see a pattern here. God's wisdom and spirit at, at the beginning of creation, making the world which God intends to dwell in with man. Then you've got Joseph, this Christ-like figure who's endowed with the spirit and wisdom. Then you've got Bezalel, who's endowed with the spirit and wisdom to create the tabernacle. And then who is it that builds the temple, the actual temple that replaces the, the, the tabernacle? It's Solomon, right, the son of David. And what is Solomon especially known for? God said, ask me for anything, and I'll give it to you. Wisdom. What did he ask? He asked for wisdom, wisdom. right? Mm -hmm. And so who is it that's talking about wisdom here? The original wisdom who created everything. It's Solomon. Who knew about this better than Solomon did? By the way, if you go to Proverbs 9, it says, it goes on to talk about wisdom building a house. And then it says, wisdom prepares a great feast of bread and wine. And people are invited to this feast to partake of this bread and wine. It, it's beautiful. I mean, and, and so one last point here. In, I don't think it's inconsequential that Jesus, when he came into the world, one of the words, or in, in Jewish culture, a child usually, especially if they weren't well off, to, uh, learned the trade of his father, his earthly father. In, the, in this case, his adoptive father would be Joseph. You would learn the trade of your father. You'd watch what your father does, and you do exactly what he does. That's That's the imagery behind John 5, by the way that a son watches his father and does what his father does. So if a son has all the abilities of his father, the prerogatives and so forth of his father, he does whatever his father does. Well, in Mark 6, well, in one gospel in Matthew, we're told that, that uh, Jesus was the son of a carpenter. And in Mark 6, we're told that he was a carpenter. And the reason these don't conflict is because a son was what his father was by trade. But what's interesting is the word that's usually translated carpenter is broader than that. It, it really just means a craftsman. Jesus is called a craftsman. And if you look at Mark 6, here's the beauty of it. You look at Mark 6, Jesus is speaking in a synagogue there, and the people are put out by Jesus just appearing to be this humble man from Galilee. And yet he's speaking these profound words, and they say, where did this man get this wisdom isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this the craftsman? In their minds, these two things don't go together. You can't have a craftsman, a mere craftsman, who is so full of wisdom, such as we see as on display in this man. The, the point that Mark is driving at is Jesus is the original wisdom of God, the, the craftsman who is at his side, the one who was with him and the Spirit in the beginning, the one to whom God spoke together with the Spirit, saying, let us make man in our image. All right, so there you have the Trinity already in Genesis 1. The Trinity in Genesis 1. And so, in the first century, when... John writes, in the beginning was the Word, the Word ah. was with God, the Word was God. That would not have sounded anywhere near as uh, odd to first century Jews as it might sound to people today. No, so funny thing is, so I um, I had just read an article the other day in, it's called the Jewish Annotated New Testament, and it's about Midrash, what Midrash is. And the point, so this is 
edited by Jews and the contributors to these articles and the footnotes are Jews. The author says about Midrash, he, he explains what Midrash is, where you take a text of the Torah and then you find another text in the prophets or the writings as, to serve as an inner text and you expand the original Torah portion by means of this later prophetic statement. It fills in gaps. It, it elucidates meaning. And he, he especially points out how the Jews used Proverbs 8 to interpret Genesis 1. And I have here, by the way, I didn't quote it, but this is the Midrash, just part of it. It's on, um, this is the first section of the Midrash on Genesis. So it just goes up through Noah, for example. But there's like, there's scores of volumes after this one. But it, the first thing that it does in here when it's explaining Genesis 1-1 is it brings up Proverbs 8. And, and, and what the Jews do during the post-Christian period is they transfer what they had been saying about the Word as a person to the Torah. This is where Muslims picked up the idea from the Jews that the Quran is an eternal book. Right? The, the Jews took what earlier Jews said about God's Word as a person, and they transferred it to the Torah. So, uh, but, but here's the point. So in this article in the annotated uh, study Bible, this Jewish annotation of the, st uh, the New Testament, it says, the author goes on to say, the first five verses of John's Gospel would not have been strange to the ears of any Jew. No Jew would have stumbled over this. And it's obviously referring to Genesis 1, because think of all the terms that John uses there that echo Genesis 1. He doesn't just use the phrase, in the beginning, which is identical to the first phrase in Hebrew. He puts it at the beginning of the book. Any Jew that opens a book with this phrase would immediately think of Genesis. That's even the title of the first book of the Bible to Jews, Barashit. That's the phrase, in the beginning. That's the title of the book. So if they read Barashit, they would think it's Genesis until they read about the Word. But John goes on to say, uh, he speaks about light and darkness, just like Genesis 1 talks about light and darkness. John talks about uh, everything becoming through the Word, the same thing that it says. It doesn't just say that everything becomes in Genesis. It uses that exact expression. When God says, let there be light, in the Greek version, it says, light became. He uses the same exact word that John uses. So all throughout John 1, there's all these verbal parallels. John is clearly looking at Genesis 1 the same way other Jews looked at Genesis 1 in light of Proverbs 8. So he's doing nothing new. All right, should we take some super chats? Yeah. All right. Some of these are from significantly earlier. Let's see. Can you name any material about how Second Temple, Second Temple Judaism... Uh, the Second Temple Judaism period views relate to the Holy Spirit. Also, any good material on the Holy Spirit in general? Okay, so here there's a lot more literature written about the second person, the Memra, the Word. And I, I've often noticed this. It's, it's unfortunate that less is said about the Spirit. But that's even true in Christian context. A lot of times we spend a lot of our time focused on Christ as the Word because this is the main point of contention for people. They, they, what they can't tolerate is this idea of a person being the divine word. Once people grant that the Son is a divine person, it's it's usually a matter of course that they accept the Spirit. It, that, that's no longer hard to, to accept. It, it's really this concrete human person that people stumble over, and, and the fact that he was crucified, you know, that just it's, it's out of mind, right? You, you can't believe that that divine person could have been crucified. So the Spirit just doesn't get mentioned as much. But there are a lot of good books written on the Spirit, to, to get the last part of the question, in general. Uh, so there's a, a good book by Henry Bickersteth on the Holy Spirit. There's a book by, I mean, I've got a bunch just sitting here on the Holy Spirit that... Uh, well, I don't want to look back there for too long, but uh, Arthur Pink has a good book on the Spirit. Abraham Kuyper has a good book on the Spirit. So there's a lot of good books out there on the Spirit. One of the things that I would do, in fact, if you go listen to one of my debates on the Trinity, it was, it, funny to me, one of the debates that I did, this guy, it sounded like he was already 
ready to give all the typical Unitarian talking points. He didn't even pay attention to my opening statement. He said, you know, Trinitarians never give a defense of the deity of the spirit, but a solid 30 something percent of my case was talking about the spirit. I tried to give equal focus to the father, the son and the spirit. And so he was utterly flummoxed and he just sort of repeated what uh, he shouldn't have repeated from another debate. He was in the wrong debate when he was saying that. Uh, reminds me of Dale Tuggy debating Michael Brown. I don't know if you saw this, but hmm. Dale Tuggy had this prepared conclusion. And so he gives this prepared conclusion that if you're paying attention to the debate was utterly irrelevant because Michael Brown didn't do. So Dale Tuggy, for example, was accusing. You could tell he's reading it. He's accusing Michael Brown of taking things out of context, of misrepresenting this or that. And it's like, well, how do you write this in advance? How do you write a concluding statement saying the person did X, Y, and Z? Bef you know, <laughs> so Michael Brown called him on it. It was it was beautiful. But anyways, by um, the way, pe people uh, l people do that, and uh, <laughs> it sucks because people fall for it, right? They're like, if you weren't paying attention, you hear this guy uh, sounding very confident in giving his uh, prepared a prepared con conclusion. So in other words, ladies and gentlemen, this guy showed up to the debate with his conclusion already written, not making a conclusion based on what actually happened in the debate. Uh, some pe lots of people don't aren't paying ter terribly close attention what's goes on in the debate. And so someone just read an open read a concluding statement and go, "Oh, wow, what a powerful concluding statement even if it has nothing to do with what's actually been said." Yeah. So, uh, what I would say as far as Second Temple literature, more stuff would have to be sought just by going to the original sources here. So not as much post second temple scholarship, but the sources themselves and the place to go is to the Targums. So some of these are expensive. They might be cheaper on Logos, but I'm a, I'm a hard copy kind of guy. I need to have it in my hands, but you might find some of this stuff cheaper on one of those programs, but uh, you go to these sources and, and read them. Or there, there's actually there some of the targums are online. So, for example, I mean, I wish Targum Neophyte was online, but if you go, I think it's targum.info, just targum.info online, you can find there the targum of Ankalos, you can find the targum of Pseudo Jonathan, the fragmentary targums on the Torah, those are all on the Torah. And then if you carefully search that site, you'll also find a link to the Targum on the Psalms and the Targum on Isaiah. Uh, one other example, by the way, just as an aside, in um, Isaiah 6, when God says, whom shall I send, who will go for us? In the Targum, it says that Isaiah saw the word. When it, when it says that Isaiah saw the Lord and, and the Lord spoke to him, it was the word that he saw. And the reason that's interesting is because God speaks in the plural there. But in John 12, when John quotes Isaiah 6 to explain the unbelief of the Jews, because in Isaiah 6, the Lord tells Isaiah, go to this people and be you ever seeing, but never perceiving, ever hearing, but never understanding. John cites that, and, and he uses it to explain the unbelieving response of the Jews to Jesus. And he says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke about him. So John explicitly tells you that Isaiah saw Jesus. The Targum says it was the Word, but who does John call Jesus in his gospel? He calls him the Word. So John is squarely situated in a first century context. Well, the reason I bring this up is because in Acts 28, Paul cites those words and he attributes the words that Isaiah heard to the Holy Spirit. So John says Isaiah saw Jesus, and, and Paul or Luke in Acts tells us that he heard the Holy Spirit. So who is the us there in Isaiah 6? According to the New Testament, it's the Word and the Spirit. And according to the Targum, it's the Word. But I got a little feel there. My basic point is if you go to the Targums, you'll actually find references to the Spirit. And it's clear that he's a divine person there. And sometimes the term glory or Shekinah is used interchangeably with the Spirit, who speaks and does personal acts and so forth. By the way, Anthony, you should be taking uh, little photographs of the relevant portions of the Targums, toss a little arrow pointing to the relevant part and be sharing those uh, pictures like on Twitter. Mm. I mean, you say, hey, this, from the, Targ Twitter, this from the Targum, this from the Targum of such and such. And here's what it says. Uh, 
Chloe here says, Genesis 18.3, mistranslation from the Hebrew Tanakh. Abraham okay. said, my lords, men disguised as angels, his guests, changed to my lord in the Torah and the King James Bible. Lord, <laughs> he was not addressing, Lord, he was addressing the angels, not God. Poor Jimmy. Poor Saint Jimmy. Um, so, okay, several problems here. Now, you're saying that goes back what, to... Uh, no, no, I don't. I'm not agreeing with Chloe here. Okay. Um, no, 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 I'm saying you're, I, I, you're, you're pointing that out as a problem with the King James or something? What do you say? So, so Chloe, Chloe's suggesting that it's it's the KJV Bible uh, that, that changed this. This is common, you know, where... I, it, it's interesting, you know, listening to Tovia Singer, who's the, the favorite Jewish uh, guy for Muslims. They constantly listen to him. A lot of the stuff they say, like, you know, what's funny is I, I've listened to Tovia Singer a lot. And I've heard on these call-ins, I've heard some of these Muslim apologists calling him. For example, uh, Zakir Hussein, right? Mm -hmm. I, I remember uh, one time I'm listening, I'm like, I know that voice, uh, right? That's his name. The guy who he debated Michael Brown not yeah, long he got ago. Yeah, he got crushed by Michael Brown. Yeah. yeah crushed well the arguments they're getting them from tobia singer and these other guys well tobia does this a lot he pretends that it's either if he can't blame it on the new testament authors then he'll blame it on the kjv it's the church that did this and they tried to lie to people and stuff like that here's here's the facts okay first of all the consonantal text for the word lord doesn't indicate of itself, whether this is a plural form or a singular form. That has to be determined by contextual factors. So let me just point out a hard fact here about this. And if you if you read the word Lord in verse 3 as a plural instead of a singular, then you immediately run into a problem because it says, Vayomer Adonai, Adonai uh, and he said, uh, but then it goes on to say this. So it's Abraham talking, right? So Abraham said, my Lord, that's uh, what that's what it says in the Hebrew text. But uh, what this person's saying is it should say Lord's, right? And he said, my Lord's. But here's how the rest of the verse goes on. He said, I'm going to read it the way Chloe's saying. He said, my Lord's, if now I have found favor in your sight, the, the Hebrew word here is, uh, and it's your singular. If I have found favor in your sight, I pray do not pass your servant, avdecha, avdecha, your, your servant. It's singular. So what this person has to argue is that the whole verse is wrong because it doesn't work once you try and change the, the word from a singular into a plural. But, but what's even worse for this is just read the context. When you go down in the context, it, it tells us who Abraham is talking to, at least who one of those figures is, right? Verse 1 says, the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre. Here it's not the phrase Adon or Adonai, it's Yehovah, right? Or Yahweh, the way some people would pronounce it, right? It's Yahweh who appeared to him. And then it goes on later in the context. Verse 13, it says, The Lord, it's the covenant name, the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? Verse 14 says, Is anything too difficult for the Lord? So th the text goes on not just to use the name that uh, could be used for men or angels, but specifically the covenant name. Verse 17 tells us that the men, or verse 16 says, the men rose up from there and looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to send them off. So here we learn that two of the men left, and one of them remained behind. What does the one who remained behind say? Verse 17, the Lord, Jehovah, said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? So the, the text very clearly says that it's one of those persons is the Lord. In, in the ultimate sense. All right. Uh, let's see. 
go through a couple quick ones here. Hey, Dave, in Andrew Wilson's debate review, he said, you were the only non-nerd there at Modern Day Debate. Lol, he said he thought you were hilarious. Try to get him on. Yeah, he, he is entirely correct. I was the only non-nerd there. There's a bunch of nerds and one <laughs> super cool D. Wood. But that's that's most places I go. There's a bunch of nerds and then me. Um, Val here says... Uh, hey, David, are the reports true that Hatoon has been reported missing for two weeks? Any comments on that? Uh, I have heard that it hasn't been two weeks that people have seen her, uh, you know, about a, basically about a week ago. Um, th there's a reason most of the people who know her aren't terribly concerned at this point. If this continues, we will eventually get increasingly concerned, but... Uh, it is entirely a Hatoon thing to do to just decide to do something and go do it and not and not tell people. Um, I mean, Anthony, we were right beside her and lost her when she went off into a mosque, and <laughs> eventually, you had to eventually go <laughs> go find her and so on. Um, yeah, but yes, and so this is something that Hatoon is known for. The reason that people are concerned now is it seems like a dangerous time with all the stuff going on and protests and uh, Dawa guys calling to on their followers to be more aggressive and uh, terrorist organizations calling for attacks and so on. It's like, okay, yes, we've all lost, we've all lost contact with Hatoon in the past. And that's, that's just Hatoon. Now it's kind of a dangerous time. So you lose contact and you start, you know, your mind starts wondering, well, did something actually happen or did she go off and not tell it, tell anybody? Uh, so yeah, this is uh, I'm not, I'm not terribly worried right now. I think we're going to hear from her uh, might be two days from now, might be a week from now, but yes, as, if it continues and we don't continue not hearing from her, then yeah, that would become more, more of an issue. Uh, here you go. Here you go, Anthony. Given the fact that many Old Testament verses discuss angels being sons of God, Genesis 6, Job 1, and always being close to God, shouldn't we conclude that God is talking about the, is God is talking to the angels? Now I can think of some glaring problems with, so he's talking about let us create man in our image, that this would be talking to angels. So, I mean, the glaring difficulty I would see here is that man would thus be created in the image of God and of angels. And so and we're creating the angels. Yeah. And by the angels. So God is talking to angels. So God and the angels are co-creators of man creating man, not just in the image of God, but in the image of God and of angels. So that would be some interesting yeah. theology, but what are your thoughts? So, yeah. So think about this. So several things, uh, and we, we worked through a lot, I think just drives this, but now bringing some of this up in connection with this, this question, the old Testament doesn't leave us casting about to explain who the us and the our are. It speaks of, God making man and in the divine image. And so the, the subjects that are being addressed here are involved in this, and the image in which man is made is a common image to these the persons being addressed. Throughout the Old Testament, there's explicit mention of more than one person who is involved in the creation of man, and it's not the angels. You have God's spirit, and you have God's wisdom. Right? God's Spirit is explicitly mentioned in Genesis 1, and I've shown that intertextually, God's wisdom is also present in Genesis 1. Proverbs 8 very clearly echoes Genesis 1 and tells us that God's wisdom was the master craftsman who was there with him. It even uses the same phrase in the beginning, right? So Proverbs 8 says that he is the beginning of God's way, and he says that he was there from the beginning, right? It's clearly echoing Genesis and and. This is why the Jews in the Targum said, in the beginning, with wisdom, God created heaven and earth. I don't remember if I quoted the first verse in the Targums. So you, from the Old Testament, even the immediate context, you already know who the subjects are that God is addressing. And it's not angels. And angels, moreover, who aren't even mentioned there, when you look at uh, you know elsewhere, it, it, it never implicates them in divine activity like this. They're never said to have actually done anything at creation. And they aren't even said to have been made in the divine image. Now, think about it, because I know people assume that, you know, I remember before I became a Christian, I used to think, as a lot of people do, that when somebody dies, they become an angel, right? That's that's the goal of, of existence or something. It's not true, Anthony. 
it's not. But but think about it. There's something fundamentally different about man that you know that distinguishes him from the angels, and it's that he was made in God's image. Mankind is more special to God than the angels. This is why in in Prov- or Psalm eight, the the psalmist says, "What is man that you're mindful of him?" the son of man that you care for him. You've, you've created him a little lower than the angels, to be sure. He's he's lower in the sense that uh, the angels dwell in heaven and for a time occupy a more exalted position. But but it goes on to say uh, that, that man is destined to be exalted above the angels, to be crowned with glory and honor. That's why the New Testament says it's not to angels that God has destined the world to come to be subjected, but to man. And it says that men are going to judge angels. Well, one of the fundamental distinguishing thing about the human race is that we are a race, right? The angels are not a race. You don't have dad angel and mom angel and baby angel, right? They're not offspring. They're not uh, corporately related to each other like that. They're discrete creations. The human race is a corporate entity. We are united, related to one another through a common you know, parentage. So we are social beings and we exist as a as a race. That's why the phrase for Adam, the, the first man, is also the name for the race. The same word in Hebrew for man or for Adam and for mankind is, is the one word Adam. And so that's a fundamental distinguishing thing about men. Hebrews 2 says that it's not angels that Jesus helps, but the, the, the human race. He took our nature. And it's because we are a, uh, you know, there, there's a fundamental unity in the race that Christ's death could be beneficial for not just one person. If Jesus took on an angelic nature, how would that benefit angels in general? How could they benefit from that when there's not this corporate solidarity? They're not a race, like I said. But he can take our nature and by dying in our nature atone for the sin of of men, right? Not just one man, but, uh, you know, all, all who come to him in faith. So man is made uniquely in the image of God. But now think about this. I don't know if Yossi is asking this as a uh, Christian, or uh, I don't know where Yossi's coming from, but number one, I've already said this is not how the Old Testament teaches this. But think about the New Testament. In the New Testament, it talks about man being saved, which includes not only being delivered from guilt and, and judgment, That's what Christ's blood does. He atones for our sin. But we're also told that he's delivering us from our corruption. We've we've despoiled the image. And and what does that involve then when God restores us to the perfection of the divine image? Think about how the New Testament describes this. It speaks of us being conformed to the image of the Son. Why does it say that? Why does it? It's assuming that the Son's image is that image that we need to be restored to. And who is involved in doing this? 2 Corinthians 3 says that we are being transformed into that image by the Spirit. So the Spirit is the active agent transforming us into the divine image. All this is is of a piece with Genesis 1, and understood in its Old Testament context as the activity of three persons. Father, Son, and Spirit made man in their image, their common image. And the New Testament says we're being restored to that image by the Son and by the Spirit. So, Old and New Testament agree here. Next question. Uh, this is actually a response to Chloe, who was asking the question about, uh, or who's, who's uh, making a claim about Genesis 18. Um, in Genesis 18.22, Abraham is standing before the Lord, so Yahweh, uh, the same being who was at the camp in Genesis 18.3. True or false, Anthony? Yes, true. Do you agree or not? Yep. Okay. Uh, so interestingly, so Chloe wants to talk about uh, somebody changing things here. If you look at the, there's something called the emendations of the Sofarim, which means there were some statements in the text that they weren't comfortable with. And so sometimes they would add these marginal notes indicating, well, it says this, but you should read it this way <laughs> because they, they didn't want people coming to the wrong conclusions. Well, according to the emendation of the Sofarim, it, it, it's actually more forceful. They're trying to avoid. Uh, they would have read it earlier as the Lord remains standing before Abraham. Okay, so our version says Abraham was, you know, they're standing before the Lord. But according to the the earlier reading, it would be the Lord was there standing before Abraham. 
so the sophorim are actually responsible for softening this for for us so uh for what it's worth uh, you know that's interesting discussion and scholarship all right from seeking dawkins finding jesus learning greek or hebrew first and then aramaic is <sighs> it worth it i would my my limited knowledge here uh i would say if you're just interested in learning it for general theology or for apologetics or whatever, I would think that Greek would be uh, more handy in general, unless you're focusing on something that uh, that, uh, that Hebrew would um, help with. But I would say with that said, even though for your for your for your average Christian apologist or whatever, I would think Greek would be more uh, uh, would come in more handy. Uh, you do. We do need a significant number of people who understand the Hebrew because you have people who uh, who use it to attack various positions and so on. But what are your thoughts on this, Anthony? Yeah, basic same thing. Just it depends. It depends what you're doing. So, you know, I it, it's a fact that. So I know a lot of pastors who go through school and they they learn Hebrew, they learn Greek, but. Well, first of all, a lot of seminaries don't teach the languages very rigorously. Sometimes you get seminaries that'll push people through with some sort of intensive course. So they're learning it in like a four week block and they're not really learning the language. They're just sort of cramming down some aspects of it. And that sort of thing is easily lost. And and so there are a lot of pastors, though, that they they tend to focus on the Greek and, and whereas they'll lose Hebrew very fairly quickly they often improve in their Greek. That's just a fact. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's well known. Uh, and, and part of that would just be because a lot of pastors are speaking more on the new Testament books. They're not as focused on the old Testament. And besides that, Greek is a more involved language. And so you, you have to be better at your Greek to make much progress than, you know, most people can get away with some stuff when it comes to the old Testament knowing only a little, it's not as easy when it comes to the New Testament Greek. So, but again, a lot depends on what you're doing. If you're interacting with Jewish people, it'd be indispensable to know Hebrew. Uh, if you're trying to tackle Muslims who are misusing contemporary Jews as their benchmark, and you want to refute that, it would be relevant to know the Hebrew especially. But but uh, yeah, just a lot would depend on where you're, what you're doing. And then so as far as Aramaic... It's just going to depend on whether you're doing something where Aramaic would be relevant, because yeah. that's not that's not a lot. There's not a lot in Aramaic unless you're actually going to the Targums, right? Yeah, and, and once once one learns Hebrew, I'd say this Aramaic would be easier to learn because it's similar. Uh, you know, I I I had thought a couple of times, you know, would I be interested in learning Arabic? And I thought, you know. Um, I'd rather spend my time progressing in the biblical languages. If I was younger and I knew what I know now, if I if I could retain the knowledge that I have now of Hebrew and Greek, I'd try and add he, or uh, Arabic. But at this point, I'm like I'm I'm not going to even even try that. But th this is my point: it would be somewhat easier to learn Arabic because it is somewhat related to Hebrew. So that I remember when I started taking Hebrew, because I had been doing uh, Islamic apo apologetics towards Islam for a couple of decades before I had ever walked into a Hebrew class, through those conversations, I learned a bunch of Arabic words. And I was uh, interested, as I was learning Hebrew, how many words were in common. So there were times I could guess what the Hebrew word was because I had done, I had talked a lot to Muslims and, and heard that word before. So it, th there's, e there's ease, e it's easier to learn Aramaic after learning Hebrew. So for what that's worth. All right. So, uh, yeah, again, depends on if you have some special interest in dealing with something specific. If not, we, we would probably say Greek would come in most handy as a, as a Christian. Uh, let's see. If Allah is called the greatest deceiver, then how can I believe it when he says something is true or not? Yeah, that is the great mystery. Uh, and we pointed out before Abu Bakr, what, Muhammad's one of Muhammad, not only one of Muhammad's companions, uh, his his 
best friend, his father-in-law, the first of the rightly guided caliphs. And he was one of a few people, one of a handful of people who was guaranteed paradise by Muhammad himself. And Abu Bakr once said, if I had one foot in paradise, I would still fear Allah's deception. In other words, this is Abu Bakr saying, if I had one foot in paradise, I would still fear Allah's deception because I believe in a God who can trick people and deceive people, make them think they're getting something when they're not. And notice what he's saying here. Since he was guaranteed paradise by Muhammad, what he's actually saying is, I, I, I could believe, I would st I'm still worried that Allah was deceiving me through Muhammad, using Muhammad to deceive me. That's just what happens when you believe in a sort of uh, omnipotent deceiver. And by the way, it had happened before. In Surah 8, when Allah gives, Allah gives Muhammad a vision convincing him that there are only a few Meccans showing up at the battle. And uh, of course, it, it, they were, the Muslims were totally outnumbered. And then Allah explains, hey, I tricked you guys into thinking there were only a, a few people showing up to actually convince you cowards to go out and fight. And so, but notice this, wait, Allah used Muhammad to deceive people into doing what he wants. And once you've absorbed that idea, especially if you focus on the standard Islamic view of Jesus' crucifixion and so on, you're realizing you're dealing with a, a God who might be tricking you all the time and you just don't know. Because notice if you, if we ask our Muslim friends, hey, why did Allah trick the Jews of the time of Jesus and even his followers into believing that he died on the cross when he didn't? At first, they'll say something like, oh, because, you know, to rescue Jesus, no, 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 Jesus is taken to, to, to paradise. What? He was totally safe. There, he's in no danger. Why does Allah take the additional steps of tricking people into thinking that Jesus had been crucified? There's no explanation. At the end of the day, all you can say is maybe Allah just wanted to trick all those guys for some reason. And once you've absorbed the idea that, wait a minute, maybe he, Allah just tricked everyone through Jesus <laughs> because he just didn't like these guys. And so he deceived them. And, and started the world's largest false religion, starts Christianity in the process. Once you've absorbed that idea, well, how do you know Allah just didn't like Arabs and he decided to trick them all through Muhammad? And that, yeah, that's just one of the problems. Uh, any Anything else on that, Anthony, or did I crush that one? You crushed that one. But let me say this real quick. Uh, so I know you know about the argument of some that there's another way to read this. There's actually more than one way to read it, but there's some strong arguments that people have made for some alternative interpretations of Surah 4157 and the crucifixion, right? But here's what's interesting to me. I'll just throw this in and leave it at this. But one of the primary references to Allah as a deceiver is Surah 354, where he's called the best of all deceivers. And it's right after that that it talks about what happened to Jesus. So it's interesting to me that, that these two things are you know, so in one place you have Allah being called a deceiver in connection with its statement about Jesus. And then in Surah 4157, it seems to be describing, without using the word deception there, it seems to be describing deception. At least that's the way most Muslims have read it. So mm -hmm. it's interesting to me. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Mark here says, how do Muslims react to God's true name, Yahweh? Um, that is an interesting problem. And matter of fact, I mean, one of the best uh, videos on this was AP's video, where he points out that, you know, Allah in the Quran and Muhammad don't seem to know what God's name in the Bible is and makes no reference to it except in the names, the names of prophets and so on, which are uh, sometimes based on the name Yahweh, their versions of the name uh, Yahweh. And uh, these names are used, and yet Allah is so Allah is using the names, and yet has no clue what what these names even mean. Yeah, you know, there's a there's another s sort of side to this in the sense that uh, so here's Allah in the Quran not speaking like the way first century Jews would have been familiar with. So they knew the name of God, the covenant name. And used it, and God used it. But you also have in the Quran Allah speaking in ways that make no sense in, from a Jewish standpoint, e even when talking about first century things. So, for example, uh, one of the phrase I used it a minute ago, I, the, when it, Allah is called the best of deceivers, right? He's also called the best of creators. 
the best of providers. The, that's just an Arabic idiom, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It, it's not like Allah can't communicate to them using their idioms. That's not my objection. What becomes problematic is once you see Allah speaking this way in the context of relating what was supposedly said in the first century. by So, for example, mm -hmm. uh, Jesus in, in Surah 5 is supposedly uh, responsible for saying, Allah is the best of providers. That's not how first century Jews spoke. And it's kind of like uh, it, it, Jews obviously weren't polytheists. They didn't believe in multiple gods, but they didn't call it shirk, right? That's not how they spoke. They would have called it idolatry or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, guys, again, I just want to make sure everyone understands the, the, the point you're making here. Um, so you have in the Quran, and so the Quran is, uh, is Arabic. And when Allah is speaking, so Allah has his way of speaking. And then, of course, uh, he tells Muhammad to say certain things and so on. Uh, and we say, OK, that's all fine. Allah can speak how he wants and tell Muhammad to speak how he wants and so on. But then Allah in the Quran describes these conversations uh, with Abraham and Moses and Jesus and so on, describes all these, these things that were said in the past or sometimes in the future and so on. Um, and everyone sounds exactly like a 7th century Arab. Everyone speaks exactly the way Muhammad spoke. And so it's like, wait a minute, what, what, what are all these guys from, from all these different, you know, who spoke different languages in completely different places? Why do they all speak exactly like, uh, like a 7th century Arab? Yeah. And you probably remember, I think you've read it. I think I've seen it on your shelf before, um, the book by Richard Bauckham, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. Mm -hmm. One of the things he points out in the in the book is how remarkably consistent the Gospels, the New Testament writings are with everything we know about the first century that wouldn't have been known to somebody, say, in the second century, writing after the fact when Jerusalem was destroyed and all the rest. But so, for example, when you look at the what we've unearthed, the, the statistics of the names, the kind of names that are used, how what names were predominantly used, you know, what was first, second, third. It, when you look at the New Testament, it, it matches up perfectly. Mm -hmm. the, the names are the same as you would find in the, like if you were to write a book, if I were to write a book about the first century, I'd probably make some mistakes. I, I would not catch that, you know, I'm, I, you know, like maybe I'll, I'll call some guy uh, Joey, right? You know, because I'm Italian or something, mm -hmm. but nobody would have been called Joey in the first century. Yeah, right? especially, but, especially if you're writing in the U.S. for other people who are in the U.S. who don't know who don't know about the first century and and people who don't know, they wouldn't notice that you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, but if you were to circulate, if your writings were somehow circulating as uh, as an accurate description of first century Israel, and then eventually people were to investigate, they would find all sorts of uh, places where, where you screwed up. And so you're pointing out that they actually uh, did that. Like, so so they, they do the math and they, they calculate the frequency with which names occur. So you've got, you know, Cephas and uh, Judas and so on. You got the names and so on. But then just based on gravestones and things like that, people actually count up the per the, the frequency of names in the first century. And it's, it's like right on the money, like right on the money. Yeah. Like, like this name occurs in the Bible, the same, the, exactly as you would expect it during, during that time. And so, uh, so you're pointing out that this is, it's like the opposite in Islam. It's yeah. The, the, the author Quran. of the the author of the Quran sounds like someone who was not at all familiar with first cent with with really anything outside of first century for uh, seventh century um, not familiar with anything outside of seventh century Arabia except for what's being copied from the Jews and Christians and other sources but then is all being reworded in the language of seventh century Arabia. Yeah. A another example real quick is the phrase son of Mary. Every When the Quran mentions Jesus, it constantly calls him son of Mary. But in first century Israel, that's just not the way you would do it. So in first century Israel, you'd either call a person by a patronymic after the name of his father. So that's why you see in the New Testament, Jesus, the son of Joseph, or Simon bar Jonah, the son of Jonah. There's That's Aramaic. Uh, or you'd have a person distinguished from other people with the same first name by reference to their town. So Jesus of Nazareth, that's that's another way the New Testament does it. Uh, you, you might have some other distinguishing feature, like uh, Thomas is called Didymus, which means the twin, because he has a twin brother. So it's that Thomas, right? Because they don't have last names. It's that Thomas who's a twin. 
So but when the Quran talks about Jesus, first of all, it thinks that Christ is his last name. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you look, uh, people are, it's one thing in the Bible after the Gospels, once Jesus has been so thoroughly identified as the Christ, they will use Jesus Christ together as a compound name. But during the history, when they're recording the historical dialogues, nobody's calling him Jesus Christ. They're asking if he is the Christ. They're understanding it as a title. It's only after the fact that they start saying Jesus Christ. The Quran doesn't seem to know this. It's, it's just ignorant of these, these uh, features. Mm -hmm. uh, aren't the eyes really the leather strap of the anus? <laughs> According to Muhammad, yes. So the only way out of that is to conclude that Muhammad is a false prophet. Isn't there historical evidence that the Bible was not changed or corrupted? Uh, yeah, you just, uh, Anthony just went through uh, some of that. But yeah, the at, at the end of the day, when someone says the Bible's been corrupted, you need to, first thing you need to do is ask, what do you mean by corrupted? Um, because you're going to see what's called equivocation. They're going to change the meaning of the word and so on. So if, for instance, you mean there are textual variants and you mean that you think that means corrupted, well, then every book of the ancient world has been corrupted because there are everything that's copied by human beings, human beings make mistakes. And, and that happens. That happens with the Quran, happens with the New Testament. Doesn't matter what it is. People make uh, textual variants and so on. And lots of times it'll be things like, you know, you're talking about the New Testament. Lots of times it's just like spelling variants and so on. In other words, you can, the word, the name John can be spelled with one new, that's an N, uh, one N or two Ns. So if you're copying it, you're, you're going to write that how you write it. You know what I mean? If, if you spell it John with one N, you're going to spell it with one N. If you write write it with, with two Ns, you're going to write it with two Ns. Notice that counts as a textual variant. So in other words, when people like Bart Ehrman are, are counting up the textual variants, those kinds of things count. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so the issue is, uh, at first, the books of the New Testament, they're all circulating as, uh, as separate books. This is what textual criticism does. If a person who's copying, uh, if a person who's copying the Gospel of John in, let's say, Arabia, makes a mistake. Well, a person copying the Gospel of John in Egypt or in Greece is not going to make the same mistake. So textual critics can line up these manuscripts, and we have thousands of them, can line up these manuscripts and say, okay, well, this one matches, this one matches, this one matches, this one matches, this one matches. This one from this area has a different word here. Okay, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to figure out uh, what's going on. But uh, what are your thoughts on this, Anthony? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So, and, and one other thing, uh, so scholars are able to apply principles to the manuscripts and collate them and, and determine what the original reading was, which which manuscripts reflect the accurate reading, and that's pretty roundly agreed that mm -hmm. that this is what they've done. This is what they're able to do, and there's there's not really much question about the vast majority of the Old or New Testament. Uh, but what, what's interesting here, relevant to Islam, is nobody thinks that what these things originally said was the religion of Muhammad. Yeah, it's just. It, in it, fact, in fact, like, I, in fact, I asked Bart Ehrman about that. It's like, hey, do you ever, as as you're going through here, and the you know, lots of Muslims think, oh, you you, the earlier you get, the more things are going to line up with uh with Islam. Do you ever get to a Jesus who's not son of God who died on the cross and rose from the dead? You ever get to that? No. You never find that. Yeah. And so, yeah, you, you net one, you never, and that's why I pointed out, Hey, you need to tell me exactly what you mean by corruption because the Muslim needs corruption of basic fundamental doctrines. You never get that. You don't get that. You don't get that anywhere. Uh, what's more, if you even ask people who might use the language of corruption, ask them what they mean. So ask Bart Ehrman what he means. Um, do you remember his, his debate with Dan Wallace and Dan Wallace was asking him saying, Hey, I'd like to know which, which Bart Ehrman I'm debating today. Am I debating the scholarly the Bart Ehrman? Yeah. The, uh -huh. the, the, the scholarly Bart Ehrman who acknowledges that the, the new Testament is the best preserved book of the ancient world. And you can calculate, you, you could figure this out. Or am I debating the popular one who talks in a popular level and oh yeah, it's all these variants and so on. Which one am I talking to? Yeah, er Ehrman's uh, 
a character when it comes to some of that. He knows what's provocative, what what's going to sell. He, he, he can push out these books that are going to really be eaten up by people. I remember there's a scholar named Charles Geeshan who wrote a book called Angelomorphic Christology. And the point that he's making is the Old Testament presents the angel of the Lord as a divine figure. The New Testament presents Christ as that figure. And uh, this is a neglected area he's claiming. So Ehrman, in the book, remember he wrote a book called How Jesus Became God. And what's interesting, so a lot of people don't pay attention to where Ehrman's proficiency is, his competence is. And so because he's a scholar and he, he writes on a theological topic, they assume that he is credentialed in the field. Ehrman is not a credentialed theologian. He's not a credentialed philosopher. He's a, he's he's, a he is a... Uh, keep in mind, I, I like I like Bart Ehrman as a guy. He seems yeah. like a guy oh, you could you guy. could hang out with. Yeah, yeah he's funny. He's uh, he's fun to he's fun to have a discussion with, and so on. Uh, but yeah, I'm like you in that. I mean, my my field and my my area of specialization in philosophy is the problem of evil. Uh, I read some of his book because keep in mind, the problem of evil is actually why he's an atheist. Uh, Muslims think, oh, he read the New Testament. Oh, I have to reject religion. No, no, no. He he he. Uh, uh, yeah, he said in his book, God's Problem, that it's because of the problem of evil that he rejects uh, belief in God. But yeah, I was reading his book on the problem of evil, and it's, uh, I mean, it, it it's exactly what you would expect from a sort of popular level, nothing sophisticated. But in his debates, I mean, he's appealing to a, a kind of like Bayesian sort of reasoning based on Hume's critique of miracles. And it's like, what, like at the philosophical level, people know that Hume had massive problems in his reasoning and so on. And Ehrman's just taking it for granted that this is an airtight argument. It's a, it's a massively, massively problematic argument. Uh, but anyway, he doesn't seem to be aware of it. Yeah. So, so here's the, this is funny. This, here's the reason I brought this up. So Ehrman ventures off the reservation. He's a textual scholar and he's good, a good textual scholar. There's useful material there. When he does popular books, he says things in ways that are going to be provocative to Christians and uh, ultimately be relished by anti-Christians. But especially when he gets into theology, though, he he makes claims that just aren't true. And uh, he quotes Gieschen, and he what he claims Gieschen is arguing is that Jesus was originally just viewed as a created angel. Right. He, he, he ignores the fact that that Gieschen is arguing that the angel of the Lord is not a reference to a creature. It's a Old Testament phrase for a theophany, a divine person. So Gieschen, Gieschen found out about this and he wrote a response to Ehrman. Check out the last line. Now, those that aren't familiar with Ehrman's books might miss it. But uh, he says this is the last couple of lines. He says, I have attempted to quote and represent Ehrman's understanding of Paul's Christology accurately. He should have done the same with my understanding of Paul's Christology, which is radically different from his. After all, I would hope that a renowned textual critic who wrote the book Misquoting Jesus would be more careful when using quotations from other scholars. <laughs> hmm, interesting. <laughs> That's classic. Yeah, it's Ehrman. pretty pretty sick burn there. Uh, <laughs> uh, super chat for Snipe. Uh, thanks. Benjamin says, a Muslim friend changed his views on the Bible. He now thinks Allah revealed himself differently for different communities and that Christians who follow the Bible and do good deeds will go to heaven. Well, there's a reason your friend is saying that. You find all of that in the Quran, right? Uh, Allah says that he uh, established different communities because they wanted them competing with each other in good works. But part of that is that Allah revealed scriptures to... Uh, to various groups. By the way, this is it's awesome that you're you're saying this right now, Benjamin, because that's what my I mentioned that I'll have a video probably coming out this weekend. But for uh, channel members, you should see it somehow tomorrow. But this is what my video uh, is about. What you actually find in the Quran is that Allah sent prophets. He sent messengers to all people, to every group in the world. The Arabs were the last to receive their messenger. They're just dead last. That's why Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, and that's why the Quran is in Arabic. But the perspective you get from the Quran, everyone is supposed to acknowledge that Muhammad is a prophet, but everyone is supposed to go with the scriptures that were revealed to your people, to your group. Now, the problem is Muslims eventually figured out, oh, the, uh, these other scriptures don't line up with Islam. They must have been corrupted. Not what Allah says. But yes, there's there's a reason your friend is concluding that. That is what you find in the Quran. 
the problem is it doesn't work. So how could Allah be revealing to, let's say, uh, first century Christians that Jesus is the divine son who died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead, and then reveal later on, no, Jesus uh, isn't the son of God. He didn't die on the cross and he didn't rise from the dead. Th your friend would have to be actually believe that Allah is just completely contradicting himself. He's 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 going around and establishing completely contradictory religions. Keep in mind, we're not talking about something where, like an abrogation, where Allah can give a rule and then later on give a new rule. I, I grant that possibility. Anyone who's had kids know, okay, you know, when my kid is eight, that, you know, I have one rule. When my kid is 12, I have a, you know, I give him a different rule because he's older and, and has more responsibility. Um, we're not talking about that. We're talking about Allah just revealing something to one person as factual and then going to another person later on and saying the exact opposite and contradicting himself. And that should be an issue. But yeah, you'll want to, uh, you, you, you've got some, you've got some interesting conversations ahead with your, with your friend. Uh, any thoughts on that, Anthony? <coughs> no, no, okay. that's good. Um, I find Muslims attack tritheism, not the Trinity. You agree? Absolutely. And there's a reason it's a lot attacks tritheism in the Quran. Surah 5, verse 116 to 117. Allah, when he is trying to attack the doctrine of the Trinity, actually attacks tritheism and doesn't seem to know what, what the actual doctrine is. And so it's interesting. I understand Muhammad not understanding what the doctrine is. I don't understand Allah not understanding what the doctrine is. And so if Allah completely gets the doctrine wrong, which he does in the Quran. He does he he nowhere accurately describes the doctrine of the Trinity that he's telling people to reject. If Allah is all knowing, then he would know, in which case when he misrepresents it, he's doing so deliberately and he's deceptive. The alternative is that he's not all knowing. So Allah is either ignorant of what Christians believe or he does know what Christians believe and he's deceptive. Take your pick. Ignorant or deceptive? Muslims, if I were you, I'd go with deceptive because that's what he constantly brags about. Um, this was a question for you. Are you referring to Sanhedrin uh, 97b with the Jews expecting the Messiah to come during the Second Temple period? If not, what reference did you have in mind? So what were you talking about? Well, so uh, I would have to have Gray's or whatever leave a comment on the video and then I'll search for it and give you some other references. It wouldn't just be the Talmud. There's other Midrashic sources and, and that sort of thing. But when they, when they interpret things like Zechariah nine or Daniel nine, those are texts that pretty much wall you into identifying the second temple period as the period in which the Messiah would come. Uh, and there's a bunch of other stuff that goes along with this, but you know, sometimes you'll get attempts to say things like, well, Messiah will come under these conditions, but if these conditions aren't met, then he won't come. So they, they do try in some cases to provide wiggle room. Uh, but for the most part, it was pretty standard to, to think that he had to come during the second temple period because he had to come to the temple, right? Malachi 3 uh, talks about the Lord suddenly appearing at his temple, the messenger of the covenant, which was interpreted messianically. Or again, but Zechariah 9, where it talks about your king is coming to you gentle and riding on a donkey. Zechariah is talking in that in these contexts about that second temple. And uh, likewise, Daniel 9 is talking about uh, the temple being rebuilt and talking about the Messiah coming and being cut off in conjunction with all of that. So uh, these would be the texts. And so th it's not just referenced in the Talmud. So Sanhedrin uh, 97b is what he's referring to in the Talmud. Wouldn't be the only place where that sort of thing is discussed, but I'd have to give you the references uh, after the show. Yeah, so ask the question in the um, in the comment section afterwards, and then Anthony can respond to you there. Uh, Emil says, if the Bible's corrupted, then the Quran has been too. Yes, yeah, since the Quran affirms that uh, that the Bible is the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of Allah, then if that's not true, you can either conclude that Allah has no clue what he's talking about, or if you're a Muslim and you want to take it seriously, you have to say that, uh, those, par that, that those parts of the Quran were corrupted. In other words, you'd have to conclude that, well, there, there, are, two, there are two ways to go about this. 
If you want to say that the Bible's been corrupted and the Quran affirms the Bible, then if you believe that the Quran is inspired by Allah, then you'd have to conclude that those parts that affirm the Bible have been corrupted. Someone uh, made those up. Or if you're just talking in general and you want to say, hey, what do, what exactly do you mean by corruption of the Bible? If you mean textual variants, well, then the Quran is corrupted by that standard as well. If uh, you do have people who will point out, ah, but there were disputes when, when discussions about canonization arose, there are disputes about some of the shorter books like Second and Third John because they didn't circulate uh, to, with the same extent as like the Gospel of John or something like that. And so there were some disputes over canonization. If you believe that is what you mean by corruption, then again, the, the Quran is corrupt as well because Muhammad's top reciters of the Quran disagreed about whether Surah 1, Surah 113, Surah 114 are even supposed to be in the Quran. So they had disputes. And so the point is, whatever you could possibly mean by corruption, once you explain it and say, this is what I mean by corruption, show me some definition that, that wouldn't also apply to the Quran. I like to use a keto here, right? So uh, you know how a keto- You don't know they... a keto, man. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> Not literally. But you Steve, know how Aikido Steven involved... Seagal, the Steven Seagal of apologetics here, ladies and gentlemen. No, no. no. So you, well, you, yeah, okay. So uh, <laughs> I hear a lot of people say he's fake, but uh, I do like some of the earlier movies. No, he's Anyways. he's a, he's an expert. He is an expert, a world renowned expert in Aikido. But yeah, people there there are lots of people who don't think it works nearly as well as it does in the movies. Yeah. So, but you know how Aikido uses the other person's force and weight and so forth against them instead of sort of resisting it, you sort of roll with it, right? So I, I, I love it when Muslims say the Bible's corrupt, not because I, I like that in itself, but because think about it now. You, now you have to break things down the way the Quran does. So the, according to the Quran, Allah gave the Torah. Allah gave the Zabur, the Psalms of David. Allah gave the Gospel of Jesus. And then it mentions some other books as well. In fact, it speaks of Allah revealing himself to a bunch of different peoples, right? So mm -hmm. some Muslims will say the Vedas, uh, you know, the, the, the different religious books of the world were originally given. But all these were corrupted. So here's the point. Now, you, you got to, you know, this is Allah's track record. Allah gave the Torah and it was corrupted. Allah gave the Psalms of David and they were corrupted. Allah gave the Gospel of Jesus and it was corrupted. Now, if if you had the need to go to a doctor and have this operation done, you needed emergency surgery for your life or whatever, and you found out that this uh, uh, this doctor had failed in all of his prior uh, operations, would you go to that doctor, or would you be looking for a different doctor? <laughs> I'm sure mm -hmm. I'm sure you'd be looking for a, a doctor that has uh, a good track record. Now, what Muslims will say here is, well. Allah didn't intend for those previous revelations to be uncorrupted. Well, imagine imagine a person trying to get hired at a hospital says, you know, yeah, well, you're looking at my, my track record and you're saying I failed in all these other occasions, but I didn't intend for those to be successful. I wanted this, this occasion at your hospital to stand out, right? I wanted my performance here to really look good, right? Who's going to hire him on, on the basis of that? I, I mean... To me, this just looks bad. I mean, how, how do you possibly have this as, I mean, I'm supposed to believe in this God and he's constantly yeah. fumbling. Yeah. The, especially fumbling. when you have, especially when you have Muslims, uh, Muslim apologists who will make excuses like you just gave. Oh yeah, but he didn't really want to preserve those. And yet you go to the Quran and he's still acting like they are authoritative, reliable scripture to the extent that when Jews come to Muhammad to settle a dispute, Allah says in the Quran, Surah 5 verse 43, why are they coming to you, Muhammad? They got the Torah. Now, notice, if the Torah has been corrupted, then Jews need Muhammad to clarify what parts have been uh, corrupted. Uh, the only way he could say, Muhammad, they don't need you. They've got the Torah. The only way that makes sense is if they still had reliable scripture. Likewise, a few verses later, Surah 5, verse 47, where Christians are commanded to judge by the gospel, not by the Quran, doesn't make sense if, if Allah thought that the gospel had been corrupted. And so, yeah, Allah seems uh, really, really confused. And if you want to say... What Allah really meant when he said judge by the judge by the Torah and judge by the gospel is don't judge by the Torah because it's been corrupted and don't judge by the gospel because it's been corrupted. If Allah is just saying the opposite of what he means, we're, we're, we're basically, it's not the same thing as when you, you realize that Allah brags about being the best of deceivers. It's just 
He's got what? He's got like some sort of cosmic Tourette syndrome. He keeps blurting things out and he can't say what he means. Is, so that's the God you're going to believe? If, in other words, if he keeps affirming the Torah and the gospel and he doesn't mean it, how do you know when he's affirming Tawheed that he actually means it? This guy constantly says the opposite of what he means, according to Muslims, not according to us. I remember when you coined the cosmic Tourette's syndrome. That was for your debate with Shadid Lewis. I don't know if you used it in the debate. I don't remember. I don't remember. Uh, I have used it in the past, though. I have said that. Uh, Back let's see. Gino Hill. Uh, Allah's pronouns, this is a good video here. Allah's pronouns are as confusing <laughs> as that of the leather people. That might be good. Allah's confusing pronouns. <laughs> Just, <laughs> there you got your video, Anthony. If you don't make it, I'm making it. Um, <laughs> can't wait to meet you guys. Leather strap to leather strap for all the, for anyone who's new, that means eye to eye. Muhammad said the eyes are the leather <laughs> strap of the anus. And here's a, here's a comment, uh, related to what we just talked about. Uh, Emil says, if Allah had failed to keep the scriptures uncorrupted multiple times before. How do you know that the Quran has not been corrupted too? Yes, especially when Allah says things. Surah 18, verse 27, no one can change Allah's words. Same thing in Surah 6, verse 115, no one can change his words. Allah brags constantly, not just about being the best of deceivers, but about no one being able to change his words. Muslims will interpret that verse and say, ah, what he really means there is no one can change the Quran. We don't say no one can change his words in the Quran. He says no one can change his words, period. So based on what Muslims tell us, Allah sent a messenger to every, every people in the world, every nation, and re revealed scriptures to at least some of those groups. And all the messages of the messengers were corrupted and all the texts were corrupted. So Allah, by the time he gets to the Quran, is batting zero. I mean, he's batting zero. He is the worst batter ever period. And so, yes, it's just very odd to, for him to then brag, hey, the reason you can trust the Quran is because no one can change my words. Like, what words have you ever said that no one corrupted? What are you talking about? You're the worst in the world at preserving your word. So, yeah, problem. Uh, here you go. Fazia says, which is the hardest for Muslims to believe, Jesus being God or his resurrection from the dead? Uh, Jesus being God would be definitely the most difficult. Uh, they, you actually have Muslims who believe in Jesus' resurrection. They're a minority, um, <coughs> but they interpret Surah um, Surah four verse one fifty seven differently. Um, they interpret it in light of other Quran verse. So when they read that uh, that they killed him not nor crucified him, they read it in the context of other Quran passages, like uh, when you were fighting at Badr, it wasn't you who killed them; it was Allah who killed them. And so they read it in that context, and it's not denying that Jesus was killed. It's just saying it was part of Allah's plan, and these guys who are bragging about it didn't actually do it. It was all part of Allah's. They, they're not the ones who did it. Allah was doing it through them. So you have people who uh, who accept Jesus' death by crucifixion and believe that he was, he was raised from the dead. And so, yeah. Uh, um, omnipotent and omnipresence tells me that God can be God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It makes sense, the Trinity, one over simple, I'm sure. Any thoughts on that, Anthony? Well, yeah, I mean, so God is all-powerful. I think there, what would be more relevant is the incarnation, right? So this is something that God has the power to do. And I mean, think about omnipresence for a second, actually. This is interesting. So in in the Old Testament, God is clearly omnipresent, but that doesn't mean that God is a finite being because scripture teaches that he transcends all spatial limitations. When we say that he's omnipresent, we don't mean he's confined to some spot. We just mean that everything is present to him. He's upholding everything and uh, everything exists in him. It's sustained by him and so forth. Uh, but Solomon, when he constructs the temple, he said he's marveling because he's constructed the temple, God has promised to dwell there, and Solomon says, will you really dwell here? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. But the account is clear. God does dwell in the temple. He fills it with his glory. So there's a sense in which God is present there, but also not limited by it. Paul says the same thing in Acts 17. God isn't confined by temples built with human hands, as though he needed anything. And but, but the point is this, though, even though God is transcendent, he's able to dwell 
in the temple and in, in all of creation. And if that's possible, then so is the incarnation, right? Because in principle, even though the universe is larger than a human body, God is infinite. So it's, it's no more of a step for God to become incarnate in a human being than for him to be present in all of creation. Right, that there's just as much of a gulf between the universe and God and a human body and God, right? So, uh, yeah, and that, I, that, just... that's and that's part of the difficulty that Muslims face and why they'll flip out over the meaning of uh, Muhammad in the Hadith when he says that Allah descends to the lowest heaven to hear people's prayers and so on. So, wait a minute, he's he's descending, he's actually so one, he's moving, two, he's moving down here to get close to us and so on. And so there are Muslims who will say that, yes, he does it, but in a way that befits his majesty or something like that. And other Muslims will freak out. No, 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 you, you can't even say that. You have to say it's it's some in some metaphysical sense, but he's not actually doing what the language clearly says he's doing. It can't be because they seem to understand if you're if you're going to have no problem with Allah um, coming down here, like how could you object to the incarnation? What, what can you do there? Yeah. All right, here you have an objection to what you're saying earlier. Frankie okay. says, I have heard something similar to this before. So this is about uh, wisdom in Proverbs. I have heard something similar. And but to be fair, this was my reaction when uh, when I was first reading it and, and hearing that people uh, associated this with Christ is, wait a minute, you got it's described in, in, in the feminine here. Uh, so mm -hmm. I've heard something similar to this before about wisdom being Christ in the Old Testament. My only concern with this was the feminine language used to describe wisdom, what is going on there. And, you know, sort of step one is that God does, God and Jesus both use sort of uh, feminine language in, in certain um, situations, like Jesus saying that he wanted to gather Jerusalem together, like a, a hen gathers uh, her chicks. So, uh, but, you know, he's, he's not saying mm -hmm. he is actually a, a, a hen, but, you know, then even in the Old Testament, you have, you know, I will cry out like a woman in labor and, how, you know, kind of mother forget the the baby that she's had and so on. Uh, but what are your thoughts on this, Anthony? Yeah. So all that's relevant. But the first thing that I would say that's fundamental is it, it misunderstands something about the Hebrew language. In Hebrew, all nouns are either masculine or feminine. So, for example, the Hebrew word for father, av, when it's put in the plural form, avot, is a feminine form. And what happens in, in the Hebrew language is you have to have agreement between words. So if a noun is masculine, then the, the corresponding verbs and so forth have to be masculine. And, and similarly with respect to feminine words. So obviously fathers are not women. But it's it's a feminine word, so you have to distinguish between grammatical gender and natural gender. Uh, when it refers to the arm of the Lord, the the phrase for arm that's used, so for example in Isaiah fifty one nine, it's a feminine form. Uh, the word for earth is feminine in Hebrew. So the, the the basic issue here is just not confusing grammatical gender with natural gender. You have to determine natural gender differently and contextually. So what's interesting in Proverbs is that while the term wisdom is feminine, because again, that's just a feature of the language and it's an abstract term, uh, but it, it's feminine. So the corresponding verbs have to be feminine or there wouldn't be grammatical agreement. It wouldn't make sense. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that a lot of people think that wisdom is actually called a woman, but wisdom isn't called a woman. You can search Proverbs, you'll search it in vain to find wisdom ever called a woman. Wisdom is never called a woman. So the grammatical fact is not problematic. But what here's what's interesting. So I pointed out that wisdom is, per, is portrayed as a person. Wisdom is described doing distinctively divine things. Wisdom says the spirit is my spirit. Wisdom pours out the spirit. Proverbs 3 says God created with wisdom or by wisdom. Uh, Proverbs 8 says I am wisdom. I am understanding. Power is mine. And then uh, talks about being a craftsman with God. The phrase for craftsman is masculine. I was a master craftsman at his side. So now what do you do, right? 
now you've got the problem that you've got a masculine term being used. And then you again, you've got all these these personal terms. You've got divine prerogatives, divine powers, divine acts being performed by wisdom. Uh, and and it, it just eventually grows so large that it becomes impossible to deny it as a pre-incarnate reference to Christ. And then when you get to the New Testament, the New Testament is explicit that Christ is wisdom. In, uh, For example, in, let's just say, there's plenty of texts on this, but 1 Corinthians 1, Paul is contrasting human wisdom and divine wisdom. He says that the world, by its wisdom, didn't come to know God, but God in his wisdom provided salvation through Christ crucified. And then it goes on to say explicitly it says that Christ, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, what's interesting is he calls him both power and wisdom. In Proverbs 8, wisdom says, I am understanding, power belongs to me, power is mine. And so here Paul says that Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God. And then he goes on to say that God has made him to be wisdom for us, that is our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, and so forth. In Colossians 2, Paul says, in Christ dwells all the, the, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He's the embodiment of wisdom. Moreover, the other language used for, for wisdom in Proverbs is used for Jesus. So in Proverbs 8.22, Wisdom is, it says that, uh, wisdom says, the Lord possessed me, the beginning. I am the beginning of his way. In in Revelation 3, Jesus says, he is the beginning of God's creation. The same word used elsewhere for God is the beginning and the end. He says, I am the beginning. It's an echo of Proverbs 8. But it's also an echo in other ways. So I didn't go into this, but What's interesting about the Hebrew word for craftsman in 8.30, Proverbs 8.30, is you can, there, there are scholars who argue for different renderings of this, because Hebrew is a very interesting language. The consonants sometimes can have different meanings, and there can be debates over this. Usually the context disambiguates it. But you have most scholars saying it means craftsman. Other scholars say it means faithful or true, Right. Well, what's interesting in Pro or Revelation 3, where Jesus says, I am the beginning, he also refers to himself as faithful and true. Another way that scholars have translated this is, is, that, is that wisdom says, I am the amen. If you look at Revelation 3, it says, thus says the amen, right? And he, and he also calls himself faithful and true, and he calls himself the beginning. This is an echo of Proverbs like three or four times over, right? It, it's... it's uh, and, and this has been noted by by numerous scholars. So, and, and by the way, the one of the things to notice is that a lot of this is taking place in the same author, the author of John, who's doing the same thing with Genesis one that that the Jews did with Proverbs eight and Genesis one. John is the one who who reads Genesis one the same way that the ancient Jews did when he says, "In the beginning was the Word." And then he's the one that's using these phrases for Jesus, like the beginning. In fact, um, in in First John two, First John two, John says about Jesus, "You have known him who is from the beginning," and he repeats it several times in First John. This is a phrase right out of Proverbs eight. He says, I, "You know, wisdom was there from the beginning." It's the exact phrase. It, you know, it's not just the word beginning, but from the beginning. I mean, so. It's a very tight case, and, and there's a lot more that, that could go into this. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> look at a couple of comments here. Uh, so we have uh, Myth Right Workshop says, sounds like the Bible supports queer theory. And that's based on the idea that you have gendered language in the Bible, which is true of a lot of languages. It's being pointed out. People are pointing out this is the same in German. It, it, English speakers generally yeah. are familiar with this because we don't, we don't have much of this. Um, but yes, yeah, so you say the this the that you have you have the definite article uh, in German you have you have der d das depending on whether it's masculine feminine or neuter. The point is sometimes it makes perfect sense man and woman and those having gender program pronouns. Other times it's it uh, you you say how did that get a feminine pronoun or something like that uh, or or in like cereal bowl here points out. In German, the word for girl is neuter. Yeah, it's das. Das is the neuter. Uh, das is the the neuter, and yet it's das Mädchen. So 
the girl and yet the girl is neuter and so on. So, uh, yeah, people who are familiar with other languages would, would not find this, uh, problematic at all. Um, and people like Michael Steiner pointing out, Hey, you have, you know, even in English, we use phrases like mother earth and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. we get down to Ahmed just blurting out, <laughs> Jesus is not the son of God. Notice, there it is. <laughs> notice Jesus called himself repeatedly the son of God. Um, and so Ahmed is saying, Jesus is a liar. And so you're not a Muslim anymore because you reject Jesus, Ahmed. You reject the words of Jesus. And he'll, he'll obviously say, no, the that's been corrupted. Well, your God says that no one can change his words and that he revealed the gospel. So you just called your God a liar. Notice there's no way out of this, Ahmed. So why in the name of common sense are you going to believe in the ramblings of an illiterate 7th century Arabian caravan robber who could not put forward what he meant at all? Why, why are you making that the, uh, the deciding factor in what you believe? So um, let me check out some of these other. <laughs> this is Umar using the same old, uh, when we talk about Allah being the best of deceivers. There you have it, Anthony. Jeremiah 410. Then I said, Alas, sovereign Lord, how completely you have deceived this people and Jerusalem by saying you will have peace when the sword is at our throats. Uh, hey, Umar, instead of going to lame Muslim websites, to defend your position, uh, why don't you actually read the book of Jeremiah and see what it's talking about? Uh, the 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 book is responding to the claim that God is going to protect Jerusalem no matter what they do. They can sin all they want. Uh, and that became the position when they're being threatened by invaders. It doesn't matter what we do. We can sin all we want. God's going to protect us anyway. And God corrects the prof, even the prophets on this as you go through Jeremiah. No, 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 it's not what I said. It's not what I said. Go back, go back, look at the actual Torah. I told you, if you, if you violate my laws like the pagans did, I'll treat you the same way that I'll, I'll treat you the same way the pagans uh, that uh, I treated the pagans and you'll be kicked off the land too. That's exactly what happened. So look at this. Look, Umar has a God who brags about being the best of deceivers. And in order to somehow respond to this, Umar does what? He goes and he attacks the, the God of the Bible, which is affirmed as the true God by his book. And this is just the thing, right? Ha ha, we'll insult, we'll insult your book that our prophet affirmed. Do you guys, I, every live stream we do, every comment I read from Muslims is just, I'm an apostate, 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 and I'm too dumb to realize it over and over again, like clockwork. It's wild stuff. You look like you're about to say something a second ago, Anthony. No, 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 should no. We just, should we go on? All right. Yeah. Uh, Dominic says, uh, good job, boys. Keep it up. The Trinity is the most fascinating topic available. Here's an espresso on me. Get one for Anthony as well. I promise you I will not. No, I, uh, I will. Once I see Anthony, I'll grab him an espresso. My espresso's gone. Uh, too late. No, nope, I sent that one to him. <laughs> uh, Ice Cream Sword says, really useful info on this stream. Thanks uh, to both of you. Here you go. Who was speaking from the bush to Moses? Specific person? Hope it doesn't go against the topic. Thanks. What are your thoughts on that, Anthony? Yeah, so I, I thought we probably wouldn't get to the angel of the Lord, but before, let me, so if you look at Exodus 3. We could, we could, do, we could do a live stream one day, since that's such an important topic, we could one day, maybe a month or two from now or something like that, do a live stream on the angel of the Lord and you can uh, go through that for us. But yeah, what are your, what's the, what's the short version here? Yeah. So the thing to remember, so for me, I love this text because I remember when I was converted. So I was in a jail cell back in 93. What kind of loser of converts in a jail cell? My yeah. goodness. Sorry, but go ahead. Um, so, uh, but I, the point is I was reading the Bible just out of entertainment. I had nothing else to do this devil worshiper roommate of mine was a nice guy, but he wanted to attack the Bible, told me how to get one so he could do it. And I got it. He couldn't prove his point. Anyways, I started reading it. And when I read Exodus three, I, I remember I just, I was overawed by it because when you think about it, when you say, if somebody asks who you are, you're going to say something like, I'm so-and-so I come from this place. Uh, you're going to, you're, you're, you're going to say, you know, something, about yourself in relation to other things, right? Like you might say, this was my parents, or this is my hometown, or this is, you know, you're making reference to other things to explain yourself. But when Moses asked God who he is, 
he doesn't point to anything beyond himself. He, he's the self-contained God who exists independently of everything, right? He doesn't have some ultimate reference point that he has to explain himself by. But I mention this because you have to understand that it's very clear in the text that this is God himself that Moses is interacting with. So when you go back to verse 2 and you have an explicit further identification of this figure, it, it tells you who this figure is. So in verse 2 it says, the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in the burning bush, right? In, in the midst of a bush that was on fire but not being consumed. So you're specifically told that it's the angel of the Lord. Now, people badly misunderstand this sometimes. Of course, any Muslim hearing this would would misunderstand this and, and be happy to misrepresent it. In Hebrew, as well as in Greek, the word for angel is just a word that means messenger, and it doesn't tell you anything about the kind of being that's in view. So the word for messenger can be used for human beings. It can be used for the heavenly hosts. It could be used for God in Hebrew. And the same thing is true in Greek. In Greek, for example, Hermes is called the messenger god. He, he's a god who's a messenger, and he's called an angelos, uh, the, the Greek word for ang angel. Uh, in the New Testament, when John the Baptist is sent before Jesus, he's called a messenger. The word in Greek is angel. Uh, when it says the letters to the seven churches, right, that uh, to the to the to the angel of the church in Thyatira, or the angel in the church uh, of, of the angel of the church of Ephesus, the, the word angel there is messenger. That's why some commentators will say it's it's the pastors of those churches. Other commentators will say maybe it's a special angel charged with overseeing it. The point is the word messenger doesn't tell you what kind of beings in view. You have to determine that contextually. Well. In the Old Testament, the full phrase, the angel of the Lord, is always used in the singular, and it's always definite. So it's always referring to one specific figure. When you want to say angels plural, you have a different construction. It's either just the word angels, or it's the word angels with uh, the... You'll either have a definite article used with... Uh, I mean, there's just a different construction. I don't want to go down that whole road, but the... The phrase, the angel of the Lord, always refers to one specific figure, and that figure is always identified as God. So in Exodus 3.2, when Moses says, what is your name? The angel of the Lord says, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am sent me to you. So the questioner asks, who is this? I would argue, in fact, uh, it's on my channel now. It used to be on David's old channel, Acts 17. But David moderated the debate I did with a guy, is Jesus the angel of the Lord? And I argue at length in that debate that Jesus is the angel of the Lord. So you can go look for that. It's with a guy named Solomon, of all names. Uh, but uh, the, the, the short, here's, here's the short version of the argument. In, in the Hebrew, the, the word for wonderful is not used in a loose way. We might say, I had a wonderful taco or a wonderful burger, but the Hebrew will never talk that way. You only use the word wonderful for God. Only God is wonderful in Hebrew. Only God does wonders. So what's interesting is in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, when in Judges 13, when Manoah, the father of Samson, says, what is your name? He says, why do you ask my name? My name is wonderful. And then when you go to Isaiah 9, 6, when Isaiah is prophesying the coming child, he says, uh, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and this is the name by which he will be called, Wonderful. He's given several titles, Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. When this was translated by the Jews into Greek, they showed how they understood this. When the Jews translated this, they translated it this way in Greek. This is the name by which he will be called the angel of great counsel. So they take the term wonderful as a way of indicating that the coming Messiah would be the angel of the Lord. So that, that's just one argument of many that I would give. A um, couple connected uh, issues here. VP says, the man in Genesis 32, 24 to 30, is Christ, right? You see, alhamdulillah, roll credit. So that's the passage about... Um, Jacob wrestling with someone uh, to be identified as an angel. 
Same thoughts on that, Anthony? Yeah, same thoughts. I mean, it's, it's the angel of the Lord. And it's it's the Lord himself, because Jacob names the place Peniel, meaning the face of God, because he says, I've seen God face to face. Uh, earlier discussion on angels, when you were talking about angels being uh, sons of God, in a sense. Uh, how do we know angels aren't a race, Anthony? Well, uh, you find me baby angel, uh, uh, Michael Jr., <laughs> Michael the third, <laughs> little, Ga little Gabriel. <laughs> uh, that's that's one way. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So the the idea there, what you're talking about, is humans are a race. We all we we are all related. We're all related. We have we all come from. And you pointed this out. So there's Adam, who's a person, but then we're all Adam. We're all we're all mankind. We're all connected in that way. And you're pointing out you have no reason to think that. God created two angels and then they started procreating and that's how we got all the angels. For one, one thing is there's there's no evidence from the Bible that angels are feminine. They're they're, they're not male and female in that sense. They might ordinarily I mean the point is there's there's not sexes they don't uh, as angels they don't procreate, right? Jesus said that we'll be like angels. Mm -hmm. You're not going to marry right? Angels in their proper estate aren't physical beings that procreate. Uh, Chloe, uh, Chloe had a couple of questions uh, and comments earlier, and she said, uh, thank you for your insights on Genesis 18. God bless. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, you see, Allah only made it appear like the Bible was corrupted, but it actually wasn't. That's why Muhammad tells us to believe it, but Muslims don't. Yeah, you do. This is just more. I mean, once you've got a God who constantly deceives you and misleads people and doesn't explain why, and you don't know what to believe, and then he says, hey, you have to judge by that book and contradicts that book, you just don't know what to do. I, I always think of Descartes here whenever I think of Allah. If you were a Muslim, right, you have to, how do you know anything if if back of everything is this colossal deceiver? Yeah, you don't know. Right? You don't know what to believe. You don't know when he's trying to trick evil, you, even, even if he demon. tells you. Yeah, even if he tells you, no, take me seriously now, how do you know he's not tricking you about that one? Uh, our Bill Mounts's Koine book, so this is a New Testament Greek books, good for solo learners. That's pretty much where everyone starts, isn't it? Yeah, that's a Bill standard one. Yeah, that's where everyone goes yeah. to, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Toby here says, uh, Abu Bakr and other scribes couldn't make the Quran despite all they did, but Allah sent a verse for Zayed because of, peace be upon, erection, what a man made God. Uh, couldn't make the Quran despite all they did. Yeah, no, they, they couldn't. It was, a, it, was, it was flawed from the beginning. We're going to preserve this book by human memory. It's like uh, the Quran sounds like Humpty Dumpty falling off the yeah. wall, right? The That's exactly sheep, what the sources sound like. It. <laughs> you know, how are we going to put this thing back together? Yeah, it's it's just, uh, I mean, it's amazing when you, you've, fortunately, they're not sticking to this like they used to, but when they were arguing for perfect preservation right down to the letter, everyone who's looking at the Muslim sources, wait, they're trying to preserve it by memory and and some basic, they've got some, they've got some scraps, they've gotten some scraps where it's written down. Uh, but those are just aids to memory. In other words, they're not in the lifetime of Muhammad. They're not writing it down as a book. When it says that he would have a scribe write something down, it's just to help people memorize it until they've got it memorized. And they really think, hey, this is going to be this great method until they start dying and they start forgetting things. And there, there were chapters that weren't as popular as other chapters and everyone forgets those. And you read about this, you know, entire chapters being forgotten. Um, large passages being lost because the only people who had them memorized died in battle versus being eaten by a sheep when Aisha had the only copy. And it's just, it's, it's like a disaster. And then by the time you get to Abu, by the time you get to Abu Bakr, it's like, can we just have one, can we have a physical copy? Can we make a physical copy so that as more people die and forget and stuff, we still got it. We don't lose more than we've already lost. That's what Anthony said. It's like, they're trying to let, can we piece this together? And even even the story about Zayed, when he says when it's when he's when he's told, hey, you have to compile a copy of the Quran. He said, you might as well have told me to move this mountain from here to there. It's, it's, it's so much. It's so difficult. Notice if the standard Muslim view, 
that all you know a bunch of these guys just had the Quran memorized word for word the entire thing. If that were true, you just need to sit down. Okay, guys, let's sit down and put a copy together. It's a, it'd be a lot of writing, but it wouldn't be terribly difficult. And Zay is saying this is a nightmare, and he's having to run around the Muslim world trying to find people until he finds people. And like the last guy who has this passage memorized, oh, I found him. He's the only guy who had that. If it wasn't for him, it would be lost. Yeah, it's a big, massive disaster. And it just goes to show how deceptive the Dawah guys are, that they constantly lie about this and don't want people to know it. Cam here says, but David, the Bible has been corrupted, except in Song of Solomon and wherever else I decide to use phonic fallacies. Yeah. And that's, I, to this day, how can intelligent people not get this? We spend all day attacking a book that we're using as the only support for our religion now. Wild stuff. Uh, Raymond here says, how about the ambiguous us of Genesis and the mysterious, where you been, Raymond? Did you come in late? <laughs> how about the ambig how about in the ambiguous us of Genesis and the mysterious appearances of the angel of the Lord, the personification of wisdom in Proverbs eight? Where have you been, Raymond? Did you come in late and say that? Because that's you, that's everything we've been going through. Uh let's see. Again, one can't be truth and also claim to be the best deceiver. It's a fallacy. That is a problem. So Allah calls himself the truth in the Quran. That's, that's one of Allah's 99 names, and yet brags about being the best of deceivers. Welcome to Islam. And we wonder why Muslim apologists just have no problem with logical fallacies at all, when they've got a living contradiction as the source of their entire religion. Farfour says, uh, this live is obviously lame. Oh, we got to say that in, in Ali Dawa's voice because he voiced Farfour the mouse. This live is obviously lame. The best Christian apologist AP ain't even here in it. And we're proud of that. We're not proud of that. <laughs> uh, Suzanne says, this is excellent. We need more talks like this to counter all the council of gods, aliens, Anoki stuff going around. Uh, eased my Trinity confusion. You know, it's funny. So I told you, I just made reference to this. I was in a cell with a devil worshiper, right? So uh, for those that didn't hear the backstory, this was in 93. That's where I was converted. But uh, one of the first books I read was a book by Eric Von Doniken called The Chariots of the Gods. And he's going through all of this ancient stuff where uh, he, he's arguing that Easter Island, the land of the birdmen, and a lot of these other finds are evidence for alien creatures. So he wants to pad the case. Uh, you know, I imagine now he's got a bunch of other stuff that he's using, but he, he was trying to say that all these things were evidence for interstellar travel and aliens visiting our planet and that sort of thing. And at one point he wanted to, argue that the Bible supported this and that the Bible was really just ancient man's attempts to explain their encounter with astronauts from other worlds. And so when God said, let us make man in Genesis, it was just them misunderstanding what these aliens were saying to them. Uh, but it also reminds me a little bit of some of the current, not the current, but uh, at least what was being, well, I guess it is somewhat current. I haven't kept up on some of the science, but I know that because Darwin's mechanism fell out of favor with a lot of evolutionists, they started entertaining the idea of panspermia more, the idea that uh, life comes from outer space, right? So uh, that's what some of these theories involve, but not just like it arrived here on a meteor, but that there was actually interstellar travel and life was originated here. And that's the whole thing that's behind like the Stargate movies, right? Like in some sense, uh, aliens, I mean, the, the gods of ancient peoples were really just aliens from other worlds. Anyways, wild stuff. I remember hearing a lot of that 30 years ago. Um, let me find this comment real quick. <laughs> Got to scroll down. Uh, where'd it go? Where'd it go? I just saw it. Oh, here we go. Joe Chris says, D. Wood gives hope to all of us who have personality disorders slash weaknesses. That is good. Yes. Step one, once you, once you realize you have a personality disorder, you got to figure out how it can actually be used. 
for good. So you fi- you figure out you figure out how you're different and how you're screwed up, and then you ask yourself, how can this actually be cool? And then you get me. Uh, <laughs> Emil says there's an amazing Coptic hymn written by Saint. Uh, Epiphanius, look it up on Google. Oh, our God, where are the lands of wisdom? I think this is tying in earlier to uh, to the wisdom hmm. discussion. I'm actually surprised. I expected David to mispronounce the name, but he ep- got ep- it dead on. Epiphanius? I, I, so, you know, I, I don't always pronounce some of these names uh, accurately. Sometimes... If you only learn some things from books, yeah, you don't that, no, that's a, that's a saying. If you hear someone mispronouncing a word, don't condemn them for it. It means they learned it by reading. Yeah, but uh, I've heard I don't know. Uh, so I've heard several different pronunciations of the name. I, the name that I always heard was accurate for the ancient philosopher Epicurus, right? Is that pronunciation? But I heard a guy one time call him Epicurus, and I thought, what the heck? I mean, I don't know if that's wrong or right, but uh, it sure sounded weird. Epicurus could be right. I don't know, but I always heard it as Epicurus. I've heard both, even among philosophers. So, huh? So I've heard a. Uh, we could we could we could look and see where the see where the uh, see where the accent is. But yeah, I've heard Epicurus mm. or Epicurus. I've heard both of those from people for mm. for uh, for a long time. Um, Let's see. Frankie here says, I may be way off here, but there is an idea in the Kabbalah where they have this divine tree looking thing. I think wisdom is portrayed on that tree. I remember a phrase, uh, Sephirot, we cannot think there is a daughter of God wisdom. So I don't know what the last part's about, but the so in the Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism, so it's a medieval work, it speaks of various emanations of God, the ten sephirot. And each of these has a name, and it's a whole you know, philosophy in itself. Uh, some, a lot of Jews, I mean, it's, it's not well studied by a lot of Jews, but the Jews that all everybody else learns from who are considered the, the go-to people think that this is sort of like the pinnacle of Jewish study. They, they, they withhold it from others because it's only for a select group that can handle it. So it, it's, even if it's not well known, it's, it's considered to be very, very much important. The, the point that I would make from it is it's, while I don't agree with it, it still pro- is problematic for those who have the pedestrian idea of God as just this monad, because they're presenting God as having these these different emanations, which are quasi deities, if you will. They're you know they're they're different forms of God, emanations of God. And how do they get ten sephirot, and we can't have three persons? Mm-hmm. Uh, check out this dope. Dave Smith said, "Mary to Joseph." No, no, I am faithful. It was God who did it to me. That's why I'm pregnant. So God messed with a married woman. Best lie ever. So this is stupid on multiple levels. Uh, so <laughs> le- le- if you're just going with the text and notice angel- his name, by the way. Yeah. Dave Smith. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, an- Dave. The, Dave. The, the angel appeared to Joseph as well to clarify things. Uh, and if you wanted to say this was just Mary making up a lie be quite a coincidence that mary makes up this lie about her son who goes on to live the most miraculous life in history and to have a bigger impact on humanity than anyone has ever be pretty coincidence be a pretty big coincidence that the woman who just made that up had that sort of impact on the world based on a lie dave stop being stupid if you want to deny the if you want to deny who jesus is just say none of this ever happened that's what you do Right. Say, say people made up this people made up the story of Mary giving, you know, the the virgin giving birth. Just say that was all made up. Don't take don't grant the story and then, you know, make a fool out of yourself. And so don't grant this. Don't grant the story and then just say, oh, Mary made that up because then you have to figure out all the stuff that led up to that in the Old Testament and then everything that happened afterwards. And it's just like, wait, you've got you have just got this this dumb lie at the middle of all this. Stop embarrassing yourself, Dave. 
What were we going to say, Anthony? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just also reflecting on the fact that it, Joseph initially thinks that he thinks the same thing, that there's a yeah. problem here. She's, so she's anyway, pregnant. Yeah. But it's not just Mary who's saying, I'm impregnated by the Holy Spirit. Joseph gets a dream in which God tells him through an angel that Mary has conceived of the Holy Spirit. And we have to remember the religious uh, historical context of this. Joseph is a Jew. He knows the Old Testament. Once they're told this, this, it would have been like the lights turning on. Wait a minute. The prophet Isaiah talked about this. This is what we've been looking for, a virgin conceiving and giving birth to a child. It's even quoted in the same text. And, and that's the, the other point here is that he's understanding this crudely like a confused Muslim, that if God causes Mary to conceive, then he's messing with a married woman, right? Like there's some kind of copulation going on here. This is a purely supernatural act. The God who speaks things into existence is the one who's causing Mary to conceive in her womb. So it's, it's a silly objection in a dozen ways. Mm -hmm. Pretty dumb there, Dave Smith. That is your name. Uh, Frankie D, he's the one who uh, asked the question about Ka uh, Kabbalah. Uh, he points out, to be clear, I believe in the Trinity. I am steel manning in a way, but more trying to solidify my thoughts on this. Is there any argument for uh, multi-gods and wisdom being a goddess? God have mercy on me. So you aware of any uh, multi-gods argument and wisdom is a, is a goddess, Anthony? Any good case for that? So, so first... The only basis for arguing that wisdom's a goddess biblically would be the use of a feminine term for wisdom, the Hebrew chokmah. But I've already addressed that, that all nouns in Hebrew are either masculine or feminine. Sometimes feminine words are used for masculine subjects. You can't just simplistically conclude from the use of a grammatical uh, gendered noun that therefore the subject is, is gendered that way. Uh, again, the, for example, the Hebrew word for fathers, plural, is a feminine form, but fathers are not women. Uh, God's arm is a feminine form, but God doesn't have a woman's arm. Uh, and, and the same thing is true, in fact, not just for God, but anybody's arm in the Bible. When it talks about you know, the arm of uh, any person in the Bible, it's feminine, and, and that person is not a female. So it's just a misunderstanding of the language. There's no grammatical basis uh, that is cogent that would lead to the conclusion that this is an actual female. Moreover, as I pointed out, masculine terms are used for this figure, such as the Hebrew term for craftsman. And all the language that's used for wisdom is used elsewhere in scripture for uh, the word of God uh, or the angel of the Lord. And I didn't go over all the evidence for this, which is uh, further evidence that this is not a feminine deity or female de deity. Uh, but as far as a plurality of gods, it, it really depends here what you mean, because it's certainly true that the term gods is used in the Old Testament, and it has various usages. It's clear from the Old Testament that the term Elohim is only used in the absolute sense for the God of Israel. There's only one God in that, in that absolute sense of having uh, always existed and creating everything. But it, it does use the word gods to refer to false gods, for idols, uh, for fallen angels. I mean, it, it can use the word gods in a, in a broader sense, but it's always understood that there's only one God in the sense of the eternal, uncreated creator of everything. So read, for example, Isaiah 40 through 48. Repeatedly, the Lord says, I'm the only God. There's no God before me. There's no God after me. There's no God besides me. There's no God with me. God says, even I know of no other God. He states it every way you could possibly think of and rules out that there's any God in the absolute sense. All right, a couple more here, and then we'll be out. Uh, we'll do these lightning style. Who are the two men at the tomb, Moses and Elijah, and will they be the two witnesses in Revelation? As far as at the tomb, that would be angels who are quite frequently in the Old Testament and New Testament uh, described as men. Uh, even though they're also described as angels. Is that, is that right, Anthony? Yeah, so we are told that... So some of the Gospels, the, it's interesting what they do, but it, um, when we cross-reference things, we know they're angels. Mm -hmm. Some of the Gospels mm -hmm. don't speci specifically yeah, say. say mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's... But what's interesting to me, and this would take too long to, to do an 
in any yeah, that's great why I said detail. rapid fire because I know I know we yeah can. okay good <laughs> I'm just thinking it's it's to me it's uh it's fascinating in Mark's gospel there's all this clothing stuff going on people miss this stuff they just think it's a little detail but you have uh and it's sort of like if you look at the uh the book of Genesis there's a bunch of clothing stuff going on garment stuff right Adam and Eve sin and they try and hide their shame by clothing themselves but then God doesn't accept their clothing he provides other garments for them. You have Jacob deceiving his father, dressing up in the garments of Esau. But then you have Jacob, who deceived his father, being deceived by the garments of his son Joseph, with, with his brothers put the blood on it, right? And then they deceive him with his garment. Then you have Jacob, who has relations with Tamar, when she disguises herself as a prostitute, right? And he gives her his cloak to uh, say that he'll pay her later, right? Uh, in re exchange for this thing and uh anyways there, there's all this clothing stuff going on all over the bible well there's clothing stuff going on in the, in the gospels and what's interesting is you have jesus in the at the transfiguration it talks about his raiment being uh before the father descends his his raiment is transformed before them and it's whiter than any launderer on earth could could uh, whiten them so the point is that you're seeing heavenly glory here Jesus is being portrayed with heavenly glory. Well, later, when Jesus is taken to be crucified, we're told that the young there was a young man there that was watching this, and they tried to grab him, but when he takes off, they 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 tear off his clothing, right? So uh, there, there's this young man who loses his clothing. Well, the only other time you have a young man mentioned like that in Mark's gospel is at the tomb, where there's a young man clothed in in glorious apparel. And so, literarily, what some people argue is that it's while they're not the same person, the young man who lost his clothing and the young man at the tomb are not the same person. There's a literary connection that's being created here, and it's it, the, the the short version of this is it's, it's like Jesus has been stripped of his robe, and now because of that, we are now clothed with Christ's raiment, his garments. And, and so the picture presented at the tomb is as a, as a consequence of what Christ has done. Now the young man is, is gloriously clad in the garments of Christ. Uh, but it's my, my point is just that's a literary connection. The actual being that is there, according to the parallel accounts, is an angel. And, and I know that addressed the Revelation thing, but that would be too much to get into. Um, <laughs> give, the, you give the yes or no any reason to think that they, these are the two witnesses in Revelation? I'm not aware of anything. Nobody's going to like my view of Revelation. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I, I, I believe that Revelation 11 is talking about... Which part of yes or no wasn't clear? Oh, go ahead. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, if you want to give a quick uh, your view of Revelation in, uh, in a nutshell, not a seven-minute version. So Revelation 11, John is told to measure the temple and so forth. The temple is standing when John is told to do this. We're told that the two witnesses will will prophesy in the streets of the great city. Well, what is the great city? In the context, it, it later says that the great city is, it's called spiritually Sodom and Egypt. And then it interprets it where their Lord was crucified. So the city in which they're prophesying is Jerusalem. And John is measuring the temple, so the temple's still standing when he does this. And in my view, it's talking about two prophets that prophesied during the time uh, of the Roman assault against the city. And there's there's a lot of there's a lot of evidence for this. When you read Josephus, he talks about prophets that were warning the people that the city was going to be destroyed. So much so that when the first stone Remember that Revelation says that the this this great city is going to be pummeled with hundred pound hailstones from the sky. When the Romans shot from their catapults hundred pound stones, Josephus tells us that the watchmen on the wall, when they saw the first stone coming, because it was radiating the, the sun, the image of the sun was shining off of it. They they cried out, "The sun is coming! This is the sun who's coming!" And they used the word S O N not S-U-N, S-O-N. So they interpreted it as the coming of the sun because that's what the people were prophesying, that the sun was going to come and destroy Jerusalem. Like I said, nobody's going to like my answer. 
And that was Anthony's 10 second answer. Because it doesn't answer. sell books. That was Anthony's 10 second answer that took seven minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, SSG here said, uh, sorry if I confuse people ha uh, having a uh, TBI, I think that's traumatic brain injury and dyslexic and only have 150 characters. Makes it hard to explain. No problem. Uh, Emile said, when you meet with Rashid, send him my greetings. I should have a video with Rashid coming out tomorrow because we recorded one. So yeah, that will be on uh, X17 Polemics channel. Next, Zucker Nike said, here's some spare change for the homeless man. Uh, the homeless man is not going to get, I, I keep thinking there's no way I'm going to, I'm going to give you, <laughs> going to give you any money, but every time around you, you make me stop for coffee like 11 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> anything Italian, that looks like my espresso, anything that looks like a coffee shop. Uh, let's see. Proponents against the Trinity doctrine suggest that I read Isaiah six, seven, eight, and nine. I don't think you're, it's helping you to avoid the Trinity by going to Isaiah. Uh, suggest that I read Isaiah six, seven, eight, and nine. I'm not convinced that nine, six is about Hezekiah or, Maher, what are your thoughts on, what is this? It's not Isa, right? We're talking about the Bible, Isaiah? Uh, I don't know what the WRT refers to. What are your thoughts on, oh, Isaiah, with respect to the Trinity. Oh, okay. 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 Abbreviations. Isaiah, um, with respect to the Trinity. Is this evidence of the Trinity in the Old Testament? I would think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously that's a huge topic. Go to my channel. I have a whole thing responding to Tovia Singer on Isaiah nine, putting him to shame, making him cry. He's still, he's still crying. The rumors have it. Uh, I did that last year, I think around Christmas time. So there, it's like three shows, three hours long each. So I go in great detail on this. The one problem is, is the fact that he, you have Isaiah talking about this figure who's going to be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, and he's given all these glorious titles, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All that's problematic in itself, but what I think is easy for people to get here is you have subsequent prophets who pick up on the language that Isaiah employs for this figure that are writing after the time of Hezekiah. If they're writing after the time of Hezekiah and still talking about this figure as someone who's going to come, then obviously, if you believe in the inspiration of the Bible and the coherence of it, and it's a unified witness, then Isaiah 9 and or 7 through 9, 6 through 9, can't be talking about Hezekiah. But there are any number of other problems with this. One of the things that Jews try to do is they try to say that the titles that are used there are not titles for the child, but they're titles for God. But the, the Hebrew just doesn't support that. They'll, they'll say that the way they do this is they'll say, this is the name by which the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father will call him the Prince of Peace. <laughs> so all these titles except for Prince of Peace are said to be titles for the one who calls the other one the Prince of Peace. But that's just not good Hebrew. Uh, take a while to go into the grammar. The other arguments for Hezekiah don't work. Um. Let's see, Chloe here. Uh, Chloe here says, uh, off topic, someone found the hero of Stoke. She was nine years old. They messaged you, D. Wood, mentioned on AP stream earlier. Please have him on a show with you and AP. Uh, yeah, I don't know how they, I haven't seen any messages. I haven't gone through all my emails, but yeah, find out how they messaged me because, uh, yeah, we want him. I don't know if you're familiar with this, Anthony, but there was a guy who, uh, Shouts out at a Muslim event that uh, Muhammad penetrated a nine-year-old girl, and, and they surround him. And police, police end up pinning this guy against the wall, like he's the bad guy. But he's yelling, "She was nine years old." And uh, anyway, we're like, we got to find this guy. But apparently, apparently, someone has found him. So yeah, that'll be interesting to uh, <laughs> to follow up there. Uh, Frankie says, thank you for answering my questions. May you be blessed by God. I have no other way to express proper gratitude. Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, it is a cool world where we can just go live and talk to people around the world and uh, uh, cover a topic for a while and just chat and take Q&A. So anyway, yeah, technology is cool. Um, 
Oh, that Quran only Christian. It was a thumbs up and uh, Jim Michael, Jim Michelle. Uh, oh, that was a, looks like that was a super sticker. Sheba dog shaking hips saying, thank you. And what's the true birthday of Jesus? Revelation 12 sign occurred 9, mm. uh, 3 BC feast of trumpets, December 25th was chosen centuries later. Uh, Anthony, would you think that you can actually go get a birth date out of Revelations? No, and I know where that comes from, but uh, yeah, I mean, the Bible's not overly concerned with us knowing a specific day. It, it records the fact of it, right? But it, it's yeah. obviously, and I don't, I hardly think that it's trying to communicate the day to us in Revelation 12. Like, why, why would that be the place where the Bible decides to do it? And yeah, uh, it's just, there's, there's a number of other issues, but yeah. Yeah, so as far as as far as December twenty fifth, uh, J.R. Johnson, you could check out Inspiring Philosophies videos on this. But yeah, basically mm -hmm. the the idea was they had this weird belief that a, an important religious figure would um, would die on the same day he was conceived. They had it just it was just an interesting, but they believed that this like cosmic harmony and so on and and. God is going to arrange it so that you die on the same day you are conceived. So uh, one theory is that when they're trying, but they have no, they have no birth date for Jesus. They're trying to figure one out. And so they went to, they calculated the day he died by crucifixion and then said, okay, that would have been the date he would have been conceived on Add nine months of that and came up with December 25th. So that is a theory we would, we would acknowledge that that is, kind of a weird view but as inspiring would would point out not not a pagan hey, it's it doesn't come from paganism we're What's all up? liars according to william what who said that oh. <laughs> uh towards the end I, it says william minto says you're all liars william says you're all liars no william you're Does a liar all, all two of us <laughs> or is he talking about everybody in the chat? <laughs> no, he's saying everyone, everyone's a liar except William. That's how things work in William world. <laughs> All right, everyone. Uh, again, check out Anthony's channel. Link is in the description box. If you want to support Anthony's work uh, and become a patron of his, uh, I put a link to his uh, Patreon page in the description box as well. And Anthony, if you wanted to link to anything like that uh, discussion about uh, going through what Tovia Singer said, if there's any video you want to link to let, that would help uh, based on uh, the questions here, let me know, send it to me. I'll, I'll put it as a pinned comment uh, in the comments section. Uh, final thoughts, Anthony, on any of this? Yeah, I mean, just uh, there, there's this is the tip of the iceberg. We, we barely scratched the surface. I, I tried to make this you know, ex, uh, exhaustive in a sense, right? I, I couldn't be exhaustive in terms of all the material, but exhaustive, at least in looking at one little section of scripture, Genesis one primarily, and then some intertexts. And, you know, that, that's just, I hope something that'll whet people's appetite. There, there's so much more. And David could tell you, I mean, I've done stuff with him and for him and stuff on this in other contexts and forums. This is the beginning. It's hardly the end. Yeah, this is, uh, Anthony's got a ton of stuff on this. So yeah, let us know what you'd like us to cover. We can always go into more detail. Uh, final super chat here from David. Do we just have the leather strap level or will we have more? We're going to have leather strap level for a while. I knew that if I put five different levels and, and different perks, I always have a, I always have trouble like keeping up with them because I'm easily distracted. Uh, so I was like, okay, if I just do one level, leather strap level, and I give people early access to videos and stuff, that's something I can keep up with. Uh, all right. So yeah, check out Anthony's channel. He's got tons of videos going into tons of detail on a lot of these issues. So if you're interested in these kind of theological discussions, uh, that's a place where you want to go. All right, everyone. And we will catch you next time.